and zoning board. And um, we have a quorum, it appears. And so um, I'll go ahead. The, um, we have six members present. And uh, it appears that we have three people absent. Um, Mr. Al Alzamora had a uh, family situation. And uh, Mr. Hooper and uh, Mr. Jones have a business conflict. So, uh, but we do have six, so we should be able to proceed. Um, I'd like the uh, members of the, of the board to introduce themselves, if, if we could, starting from my right, Mr. Roberts. Paul Roberts. Philip Shoemaker. Julia Latham. And I'm Jack Farrell. I'll be sitting in as vice chair for um, uh, Mr. Hooper. So uh, today um, we have a number of items, um, but only just the uh, meeting minutes and, and some new business to go ahead. Uh, first item is to um, take care of the meeting minutes from April 3rd, the regular meeting of April 3rd and the special meeting of April, excuse me, March 18th. Uh, I assume everyone has reviewed these minutes. Is there any additions and or corrections? Hearing none, can I have a motion to approve these minutes? Second. And we have a motion by Ms. Rothstein and a second by Mr. Shoemaker um, to approve the, the minutes as, as submitted. All those in favor say aye. Opposed? I updated it. The minutes have been approved. The, the, next, uh, the next item is really the only item on our regular, on our agenda. And that is to discuss the small area plans. This is a continuation of our discussion from April, uh, or excuse me, March 18th. Um, I'd just like to point out to the audience that um, the board does not have the responsibility to approve these plans per se. Uh, our role is to simply discuss issues and to be an advisory board to the council so that they, as long as the and as well as the staff, can in fact uh, finalize these plans, uh, which we are looking forward to, so that we can move on with any and all uh, PDO requirement changes and or zoning changes and or the development of the small area small area plan. Uh, form-based codes, which will be the implementation of that vision. So with that, uh, uh, Darren, if you could lead us a little bit. Sure, thanks, Amy. I think you did a great summary. Uh, this uh, is, is, is a continuation from last time where we talked about Village Place. And I thought we'd, you know, we had some pretty open and frank conversations on Village Place. And at the end of the day, I asked you, or I told you, that at some point we're going to be coming back to you for a recommendation on this plan, leading back to the Common Council, or Village Council. And, and you guys did provide me with, with some points. And I think there was some concern about some of the land uses along Magnolia. We talked through it, got to a consensus, and there was a consensus recommendation with, you know, which is something that we'll expect when, when we bring this back through, which again, as Jack said, is hopefully pretty soon because we still have more work to do on these things, uh, implementing the code. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, Piner South, uh, the small area plan for Piner South, which is NC5 South the commercial area. And we're gonna get into a little bit of, I'm gonna cover a little bit of what's in the current, what's in their current 2019 comp plan. And then we're gonna get into, into the plan itself. And I think we'll, like we did last time, I think we're gonna focus a lot on the illustrations, the pictures. We can talk about some of the other general things that are in the plan if, if you do wanna talk about that. What's going on right, right, around right now is an update to I think what Shannon might've provided you last time. It's, it's what, what the, the table that's going around just shows updated square footages and residential units from both sets of plans, and we're gonna go over that in a minute. So what we're gonna start off with is we start why we're here. We're here because of the 2019 Comprehensive Plan. The 2019 Comprehensive Plan had a recommendation. Uh, oh, darn it. I have the wrong one up. <laughs> Pulling up, uh, can we get? Screwed up my focus areas. Lori, how do I get back into, let's see here. Oh, hold on, I'm almost there. Sorry, it's almost technology that screws me up. Was this focus area two? This focus area two, isn't it? Jane, right, two there. 
There, now we're right. Sorry. There's always a technical difficulty with me. All right, focus area two. 2019 comp plan, uh, the Highway 5 commercial area. And really what I want to show to you uh, on this plan is this was the, this kind of showed the development status of the lands within, within that area. The white, which is, which is adjusted itself over here in, in, in Trotter Hills, the white was kind of the, was, is the undeveloped, developable lands within uh, Piner South. And because you see a lot of that color on, on there, I think there's probably, there's got to be well over 50 acres of available land between both sides. Uh, that's why we've had, and, uh, and this, why we've, we've moved forward with, with the planning for these areas. So we're getting a lot of development pressure in these areas. There is, I think, these two sets of lands over here are currently on the market, uh, and they have been marketed. So the, there are large parcels that are available, and that's why we, part of the reason why we're doing some of this planning effort. Um, before you go on, sure. Darren, can I ask you to please differentiate for me um, the difference between what's designated infill development potential and undeveloped parcels? The in develop the the in development in infill development potential would be some would uh, what is Quail Haven? Is that it? Quail Haven has some ability to do some infill development because there's enough land that they could add I actual see. units. I on. see. If it was in a subdivision, that would be just an infill lot. But you can see, gotcha. even over here uh, on the west side, mm -hmm. this is all zoned multiple family currently on, on the west side. There's, an, there's a small, what is that, like an eight unit apartment building sitting over here. Mm -hmm. The rest of the land is undeveloped. So that has development potential. I understand. Thank you. You're welcome. And as we're going through, just jump in and ask questions. We're having a discussion. Uh, this is this is the use allocation. We're going to get into this with another with that table that I just showed you. Basically, what this is showing is when when we get to the when we get to this map, which shows the the, the intended land use of the area, recommended land use of the area. This was kind of the square footage that they were looking at at the time. And if you start to look at how many how many single family detached units on this one, they had eight single stack single family, uh, one hundred eighty one. Interesting enough, they did not cover the west side of NC5. When I started talking about stacked multiple family, that was everything. That was everything on the east side of east side of uh, um, of NC5. The west side, which is already zoned for multiple family, they, for some reason that got excluded from the calculation. I'm not sure why. General offices that we have 351,000 square feet of general office, medical office 266,000, and so on. So you could see there was a lot of square footages contemplated in the comp plan of these various types of uses, with office leading the way, and that you know that kind of led to this to this recommendation. So this is a recommended scenario plan where there's three kind of three three of them: mixed use center, uh, which is this area, the stacked residential. And we'll get into this in a little bit. But this is that area where, where those mixed use uh, 181 units were anticipated to potentially go. Uh, you had suburban center. And this is kind of, it's more like a, I would say this area is more like some auto-oriented retail but a, and a lot of commercial. And then you had suburban neighborhood, which again could be a mixed use neighborhood, multiple family, townhouses, things like that, which are already located within this area. So that was, that was the general scenario. And then they had the big recommendation, which threw us all at the time a little bit because it was, it was, it was new. It was it was a relatively new idea for us around here. It was the innovation hub district, and an innovation hub is we thought it's an interesting idea if you if you have the characteristics to make that work. Uh, innovation hubs are one of those R and D. Uh, they have a bunch of R and D, but some 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 startup businesses, business and businesses in different areas of maturity, things like that. And a lot of times they're associated with, with, with a medical campus or an educational campus, some things like that. When, so they, it was an interesting idea that you know, when, we, when, we, when we hired the, 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 the consultant for this as, that did part of the market analysis, uh, the recommendation was the market for it, we don't have the characteristics to establish a great innovation hub here, but what we do have is we have the ability to have offices in that area. And, you know, we have the ability to have something like a golf cluster. So we, we've talked, you know, you, if you look at the golf pride, for an example, golf pride could be, so you could bring in other golf-related industries and you could have, and we'll see those maps later, you could have a golf cluster of like businesses within that area. And I think that's still the recommendation. It's not for the, it's not for the innovation hub, but it's for, it is for some offices in there. 
And then when, when, we, when we see the actual small area plans, there are some distinct changes, differences between this plan and that of the small area plan. And in particular, would be the area on the south side of Piner South where we're showing, we're, we're showing a movement to, or there, there's a recommended movement to change to residential. We can discuss the whys of that, but um, this, the, the big change is gonna be in the southern end of the Piner South planning area. Uh, everything, the other change would be potentially is this, is this movement, and it's not so much a change in land use, it's that movement of Monticello to, or Monticello to move it to the south to provide potential additional area along uh, Monticello on the north side for a potential. And we showed on the maps as a potential because it is a potential. It's currently a potential for the, for the movement of the public services complex, all or part of it. So what we did was we created about eight acres, I think, of area that could be used for that. And then we had some, some building, some area left over, potentially for some office buildings. And again, once we get into the illustrations, we'll cover that. Any questions on the general, bless you, general scenario plan here? Okay. The innovation hum concept that came out, is that still being pursued? Uh, or, and if it is, is Pinehurst investing any money to market it, develop it? Okay. I think what you're, what you're hearing more about in, in, the, in, the, in the development field and Philpsman, Philpsman, part of some of these discussions at the county level is that golf cluster. There is an interest because we're because we're Piners that a golf cluster would be something that would naturally fit in the area because they'd have a you know Pinehurst residence or Pinehurst address and that's part of our brand Pinehurst. So um, we're hoping that you know potentially if if offices go down here that potentially a golf cluster would would be a good idea. Philip, anything to add on that other than just the, that it's a potential that it's, it's being discussed at the county level. Yeah, I would say it's being discussed at, at multiple levels. Um, <clears throat> it's hard to put the pieces in order. The group I work for now, we identified 400 potential companies to come here as part of that, that golf supply and value chain. And we are getting calls mm -hmm. about that. And the question is, you know, is there space in Pinehurst? Because everybody wants a Pinehurst address. Um, you know, and that's kind of where we're at. That's as much as we're going to disclose. But yeah, but it, it's part of the discussions. We, right. We've heard it before. The golf industry would potentially be a good fit for this area uh, in Pinehurst because we have developable land in this particular area. That's There's right. 20, to 30, well, 30, 20 to 30 acres ish down in that in that area, and we, we've showed that how it could potentially lay out for a golf cluster. So, any other questions? So before we get into the small area plans themselves, let me open this up. I thought it was open. It fooled me again. Uh, this is the conference. So this was the chart that I just handed out to you, just, just that I updated from last time uh, to add a couple more things to it. But this, is, this shows the differences between the comp plan 2019, that recommendation, and the small area uh, plan development programs. There's some, there's some that didn't carry over between the two from, from a land use perspective. But this, just, this is just a snapshot showing, okay, this is what we were anticipating back in 2019, and they weren't at the small area planning level. So it was just, you know, so they, they weren't doing a detailed amount of planning. They were probably just looking at the amount of developable area that were, was zoned for, for a, a, a specific use or a potential, and they, and they ran some numbers. So in 2019, if you can see that, the, the highlighted box, again, they had the 181 stacked multiple family units. Again, they didn't show the stuff on the, on the east side or the west side. General, and this is when they were thinking this medical office, the innovation hub, that's where you see the 266,000 square feet of, of medical office, another 351,000 of, of regular general office, and then general retail of about 209,000 square feet. All told with the square footages, that was adding up to about 820, say 830,000 square feet of, of, of that, those mixed type of uses. Then, you went, went, then if you go over to the small area plans, you can, you, you, if you recall, we have low density or low intensity and high intensity plans. And you can see both west and east of NC5. So you can see how that kind of laid out. So you can see the square footages in both plans, whether it's low intensity or high intensity, that was scaled back from what, it, from what we were previously uh, showing. So I think you, you're looking somewhere about 
um, for the, if you go to the second one, which is the build out, the, the table below was the recommended, the preferred build out options based on our last conversation. So you're looking at the high intensity plan, you're looking at uh, 300,000 and some change. And then for the low intensity plan, you're looking at about, you know, just shy of 300,000. So you can see when we started to get into the actual more detailed planning, those square footages dramatically came down. Now, they were going to potentially go back up again when we start to get into those discussions on the south side of Pine Arts South, where we're potentially moving, you know, if we're moving away from any of these residential concepts, we're potentially moving away from the park concept, things like that. So that would add, you're going to add uh, office square footage back to that if that's where we end up going. Any questions on this? It's just, again, a snapshot to show the differences between the comp plan. And you can tell the comp plan is sitting at 30,000 square, 30,000 feet in the air. The small area plan, you're getting at the 10,000, so you're, you're, you're doing more detailed planning. Good, 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 good. All right. Now we get to the next slide. Now we get to the fun part. The point. Oh, I want to show you this one because we, we have to show you the existing, uh, the existing zoning on the ground. So the existing zoning that we have right now for the, for the majority of the developable area is, is situated between NC, which is, the, which, is, which is the red color, that's our neighborhood commercial, uh, OP, which is, the, uh, which is the office professional district. So you can see that down here on, uh, to the south of, of this tract, you have the larger assembly, uh, which is Trotter Hills. You can see that this has not been updated with, building, uh, with new building envelopes on it. There's uh, several new buildings that have been located in here. And then you have all this land that's on the west side. West side. Everybody lose. Oh, there we go. West side. West side of uh, NC5 uh, that has all this area in brown is, is currently zoned for um, uh, RMF or, or multiple family. So you can see there's. It's truly you have a, a bunch of mixed use zoning in this area. So we can actually create a mixed use neighborhood. Uh, down in this area, and that's kind of envisioned with the, even with the NC zoning in place that allows for a mix of uses, as does the OP. The other thing that we'll t talk a little bit about is this, you know, the, this movement of Monticello to the south, uh, the PC, the area that uh, that's on the harness track right now is zoned uh, is zoned PC, which potentially, as I said, by the PDO would potentially allow movement of the public for public services facility in that area without any zone change. Darren, why are some of the buildings grayed out? Are those ones in the ETJ? Yes, they would be in. They would be in the ETJ. Um, the, just it, for some reason, uh, when we did the layer, it's just picking up. This appears to be just picking up buildings that. Well, no. Are you talking about the bottom right? There's one right here. Is this one? Is yeah, that's the one. I was, it's one of the ones I was referring. Is that to. That an ETJ. Oh. That's ETJ. Yeah, that that maybe the, maybe that's it. I'll, that, that's the way it looks to me. It, it looks like ETJ because you got. This what it was. This is a furniture place, and this is the old the old hotel that I can't get to. We almost got there today, but uh, we didn't get there. So I think that I think that must be a case. I can yeah, that that's got to be a place, Philip, because you look at you look at everything else in Jackson Hamlet, and and you can see all the buildings are are, are all all the buildings are shaded here out. So that's got to be the case. Any other questions? We'll show you that. Let me once we get to once we get into the Pioneer South plan. When we start to look at the detail, you'll you'll see it. It'll show it'll show a little bit better, Sonia. So just so just hold that thought until we get there. We will get there. All right. Any other questions on the zoning? All right. Let's move. Let's move to the small area plan itself. Uh, I'm just going to I'm going to run through real quick uh, the, the earlier part of the document. So if anybody wants to catch anything. See, or if I see anything interesting, I'll talk about it. I know we're going to spend a lot of time when we start talking about the preferred intensity. The I, preferred I have one question. This says version draft D. Uh, we were distributed some time ago version oh, C. There's, it's not, we're, talking, we're talking the changes with spelling. There's okay. some, some spelling mind. errors. There's not, there's not, once you get to the maps, the maps are the same. So I think we had restaurants spelled one and wrong somewhere, things like that. Nothing, nothing significant. Um, so I'm just going to run through it. If anybody wants to catch me, uh, catch me up 
Uh, here's the locator map, just shows the, just shows the two small area plans. The purpose talks a little bit more about the plan document itself, existing conditions. This this just talks about uh, this is site aerial. As part of the as part of the planning effort, what we did was what the, what the consultant did was they did an analysis of existing conditions, and a lot of that was what are the existing uses, what's the existing zoning, what does that allow. Uh, as part of this as part of this planning effort, what when we start to do plans, when we start to look at plans, what helps us in our planning effort is we're always asking for what are well, what are the plans that are in, are in place now? Because those plans that are in place now help with our recommendations for the planning for the future. So as part of that, they're looking at those plans uh, that we previously that, that we previously uh, adopted and recommended. One of the biggest ones is going to be this comprehensive plan. So there are a lot of recommendations in the comprehensive plan that do follow through into these small area plans when you start to, when you start to look at those. That interconnectivity, the, you know, trying to promote a diversity of housing in the community. So all those things, are, they're looking at those and they're trying to plan off of, off of those plans. The bike plan, the pedestrian plan, you're looking at it. It's, it's informing our planning efforts. Um, thoroughfare plan, uh, 2010 comp plan, Master, the new core master plan, which has been planned out a couple times for that village place area, things like that. As part of the process, they went into an assessment summary of the PDO. So if we're, we, if we're going to implement some of these plans, uh, they, what they're recommending as part of this PDO assessment summary, uh, they, uh, they analyzed our PDO and came up with, with some, re some recommendations or some concerns about our existing PDO in trying to just implement this plan in general. Without even, the, without even talking about the form-based code aspect of stuff, there are things that are within, underlying within the PDO that would make it difficult to, to, uh, make it difficult to uh, implement some of, the, some of the recommendations in this plan or some of the, the, the concepts in this plan. Existing conditions, as you can see, as part of this existing conditions, we've got the overview, existing conditions, and really, you know, a lot of the plan, when, when we looked at some of the, made some of the recommendations, looking at market absorption, things like that, that market analysis. So if you haven't had a chance to look at that market analysis, bits and pieces of that market analysis are in this document, but they're also, they're also on our project web pages. Most of you know we have a project web page that's devoted to this where we put on all these documents are put, uh, are put onto, the, uh, are put on, onto, that, um, onto the project website. And there's also, I think we put the videos on, on, the, on there, so the, the presentations are on there. So we're putting, we're, we're trying to get all, we are putting all that stuff out there uh, for viewing. Uh, this, uh, again, showing the existing conditions. You're, you're looking at, really what you're looking at here is you're looking at, you can see there's contours. So you can see what the contours look like, and then you can see what the what the building pattern is looking like in the in the southern in the in the Piner South area, and this is when when we do a, a, a map. This is just a, a five minute walk from any 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 point around, just based on distance and averages. Figure ground. This just simply shows the figures, which are the buildings and the ground around it. And you can see again in the Piner South area, there is a lot of developable area. Especially when you get south of Blake Boulevard, there's a lot of developable area. Piner South Cottages, that's going through. That's going through. Um, that is going through uh, review right now for the subdivision. So that's at TRC review. So that will probably move forward at, at, at some point this year. And then you have a then you have a lot of land over on the west side again, which is all zoned RMF on this side uh, of the uh, of the planning area that is currently vacant. So this map just kind of really shows that how much developable land was out there. And when we started this planning process, the buildings hadn't started filling up in, in this area yet. I think we're going to add one for, for the dermatology clinic. There's one under construction right here for NC Child Development Center. Piners Coins is on here, of course. And there's a couple other in there right now. Historic district, the only thing this is showing is there's really the difference between this and Village Place. A lot of Village Place is covered by a historic district. This really is not, really not technically even in our planning area. The Piner, the Harness Track is. Uh, so when we start to talk about you know, anything that would happen 
on, on, the, on the harness track from a building perspective, anything at that point would have to go through the uh, HPC uh, for Seaway. Anything that's approved already templated on these, like the, um, the cottages? No, that, that is, that it, when we start to get to the concept plans, you'll see the cottages. When, 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 because we did provide them with that background data, so they, so they do have that information. So on the on the final kind of concept plans, because it's because it's going to happen, or because it's a plan that was approved, it's on there. Okay. So you'll see that later on. Uh, street network. What this simply shows is where the streets are going and where the dead ends currently are in the neighborhood. So when we start to look at, and the reason why they start to show these is part of what we're doing as part of the planning effort is to interconnect areas. So when we start to see dead ends and go, well, should this be a, can this be a through street? Can we connect somewhere else? Because we're always trying to promote interconnectivity uh, through some of the neighborhoods. And this area, um, there's, there's some areas which you'll see when, when, they, when, when, they, when you start to look at the concept plans, you'll see how the street, the proposed uh, street networks start to, start to come together. Paul, your, your previous question, can start to see it right here. So you see this is the Pioneer South Cottages, so that's showing up on it. So when we start to see the concept plans, we start to see the connections via Arnett Street, things like that, you start to see it come together. But this shows that, that, that there are opportunities to better connect this particular planning area. Would these blue lines be uh, <clears throat> platted roads that the village owns? <sighs> There's some private roads in there. Like if you, if you get down here to Page Street, part of Page, well, it shows up as a road. It shows up as a private street on our on our Powell Bill map. I think some of these, I don't know if Carter. Some of these might be some of these might be private in here as well. We know that this one's uh, th this is not public. Alex, do you recall anything over here? I, I think the I don't, I'm not sure if Carter or Dowd or any of that is. Uh, a lot of those are private. Oh yeah, when you get over here to Holly Pines, I think these are private roads in here. So it's a mix. It's a mix of different different types. Is of that right? They have an HOA that owns those. They would have, they would have to have a, have a, some type of some somebody owns it because it's not us. Alex, it, not necessarily. They may have some sort of agreement or something uh, in place a, a between deed. the private property owners, but I I don't know how formalized any property owners association is in there. Without seeing, yeah, without seeing the actual documents, it's hard to tell. All we can tell is that, you know, if it shows up on our maps as a public street, that's one thing. It's a private street. We don't get, we typically don't get involved. So the blue lines are places where I could drive right now? Correct. They are. Now, some of them might have some potholes in them, <laughs> but, but we can drive down them because we drove down one today. Uh, this just simply shows where some of the where, where there are stop signs currently currently located in in, in the in Piner South area. Land use. This shows the land use, the, the land use pattern. Uh, the darker charcoal color here just shows this shows vacant uh, vacant lands. You can see that there's 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 some re there's there's a good amount of retail in here, and you know and this is starting to fill up for office use. This is getting, you know, this is getting more blue as time goes by. Zoning, we talked about zoning. This talks about the, when we did the existing zoning. This just simply shows what uses aren't allowed in here, what uses are allowed. Uh, and then when you start to look at the recommendations and you go back to the, the, the PDO assessment, this is really what it line, lines up with. What, what uses are allowed uh, and, and, and aren't, based, and, and what b would potentially be difficult in implementing various parts of the plan. Topography, there's a lot of grade in here. You can see that there, there's some, some good grade coming across the site over here. And then it really starts to, really starts to go down on the west side of Highway 5 as you get towards the lake, naturally. Everything's running towards the lake, right? Uh, this is another good map. This shows your this shows your current open space trails and sidewalks, and what you're seeing is that you're not seeing a lot of lines or a lot of color on this particular on this particular map because there's uh, other in the and this is not technically in the, the the area. You've got the harness track, but you don't have really any any open space, any any 
other than the vacant lands themselves. Um, you don't have a lot of open space. You don't have a lot of trails. You don't have a, a lot of sidewalks. One of the one of the plan, one of the things that they're tasked with doing was putting together a plan that created some green space, created some connected uh, areas, and I think I, I think they did a pretty good job at that. But this just shows there's an opportunity for improvement here to better connect uh, the areas via via walking. Market analysis. I'm not going to get really into the market analysis. Um, here was that map that showed kind of the strengths and weaknesses. Really, the, one of the biggest strengths of this area, land availability and direct access to Piners via Highway 5. Um, weaknesses, no common theme in the buildings, and I think as you go through that area, you can see that there's not a lot of, there's, there is not a lot of common theme to that area. Unrelated land, land uses, I'm not sure. There, there's a mixture of land uses in there that might not be related to uh, the intended character of the area. And as we all know, the big one, traffic issues. There's always going to be, there's traffic issues. Uh, I, I know I'm not shocking you when I say yeah, that can get congestion on Highway 5 uh, daily. So. Are we going to address that? Um, I'm not sure how we can address that. Well, I, I'm really concerned because if you saw the accident, like on 15501 with the mm -hmm. Indians, that very same mm -hmm. thing almost happened to me the day before. I was going on the wrong side. Thank God it was daytime, and the person behind me realized it and slammed over, and I tried to move over. So that is something that needs to be addressed before we even do all this with offices and businesses and yada, yada, yada. I'm sorry, but we still have that opportunity to do something, and if not, then we need to readdress how much traffic we're going to bring into there. I think the challenge with that is it's a North Carolina DOT road, which is outside of our jurisdiction. Well, but you can apply and say, look, this is what's happening. We're having these issues, but I just don't agree with doing all of this and, you know, after the fact, worry about what we're going to do about the road. Well, I think. Sorry, but that's just common sense. Uh, remember, now look at this map, and I've showed you before. This map shows what the area is currently zoned for. So the area is currently zoned for, for development. We can't, we can't lock this place down with a moratorium forever. So that's why we're doing this, plan that's why we're doing this planning effort now because, because, I don't know why that says that, because this area is developable. So there, there's, right now the property owners, the property owners have a, current, have a right to develop and use this property as, as the zoning currently allows. And when you looked at the focus area extraction, when we look at, was it two? When we look at, you know, when they were originally looking at their numbers based on the zoning, look at, you look at the square footages, those, that's a significant amount of square footages between what the small area plan and the comprehensive plan, which, which the comprehensive plan was guided by the zoning. So when you start to look at it, I think, we, I, I think we've tempered it. I know we've tempered it a bit from what was before, from, you know, from what's allowed potentially an existing zoning area. So I don't know how else other than to, Make it more efficient, other than to plan it appropriately. With, you know, you don't you don't connect roads up too soon on a highway or too too close to one another. I'm not sure. Other than, with the planning effort that we're doing right now, I don't know if we can fully mitigate all the traffic that's going to develop into this area. Other than potentially changing some land use or somebody going in buying the, buying these parcels, and then. Changing, changing that use to a park or changing it to something else. So I think we try and mitigate by planning appropriately, but, you know, NC5 is restricted, and we know it in a lot of ways. Once you hit Trotter, Trotter to the north, to NC to, to 211, where you're, you're, you're really, you're narrow. The corridor is so narrow because you've got the railroad on the right side, and you've got the condos on, you've got the, condos on the west side. Mm -hmm. and there are ways <coughs> I, there are things that we're doing. I mean, if you're looking at Morganton, I mean, they're looking at putting a right-hand turn. We've been talking about putting a right turn lane on, on Morganton, so you, so, you, so that would maybe help some of the traffic. So things like that we can do. Trotter to the south, you know what's going to happen. Trotter to the south, they're going to they're going to add lane. They're going to add lanes. How that's going to look when it when it hits the north, I'm not sure uh, at this point because I haven't seen that design. But you know, there's only so much that we can you know, that we can control. The traffic is backed up. I know. I'm hours. I'm aware we were there. Yeah, not just at 3 o'clock. Or I mean, it's getting worse and worse all the time. And my concern is a safety. It's not even that you have to sit there and wait. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'd hate for you to be the one that has the heart attack and they can't get your ambulance to the hospital. 
Uh, I was involved in something recently, and yes, it was very difficult for uh, some of the emergency services to get there. But NC5 has to be improved. It, it has to be improved. So yes. why can't we work with the state if we are. we're working with your plan to combine it versus just going, okay, we'll get, we got to get this comprehensive because we can't have the, you know, more torn forever. I mean, yeah. this is a big issue. I understand, but we have to do our planning effort, and we are also we we do we we maintain regular conversation with with NCDOT as we maintain conversations with our neighbors to the south in Aberdeen. But not not all these plans always sync up at the exact same time. Okay, but this is so important with this road. I mean, maybe I'm just stupid, but yeah. why would you go ahead and try to approve all this and still not have any suggestions or things in place to avoid what is already happening? Which is going to get a lot worse. It's going to continue. I mean, there's. We're not talking about just sitting there. We're talking about lives can be. Philip, mm -hmm. so I think Philip talked a little bit about it. Too. We we have to plan for our we have to plan for our area as well. I mean, we have to spend time planning on this to get the kind of development that we want in in this area. Otherwise, you're going to get what the, what the PDO currently allows in that area, and we can cover. You know, what was Jack? No, Jack wasn't on P and Z. I think most of you are on PNZ when, when we rejected a whole planning, a rezoning in this particular area based on some of the concerns that we just heard. So we, we did hear about that. But NC5 itself, you're, you're limited. That, that I know the NC DOT continues to look at it. I think we've seen some design plans. Okay, but to add things? capacity to the north, I don't there's What are some of the design plans for DOT? I mean, should we not have something to look at for that? This was well, there's, a, there's an Aberdeen to... Um, to, uh, I guess it's Blake, no, it's Trotter, uh, Aberdeen to Blake Boulevard plan, yep, which I have correct. a copy of here if you wanted it, but it's uh, four lane to two lane, or three, four lane to three lanes to two lanes at that point. It doesn't go beyond that. And that's a $50 million project, which is not scheduled to start until at a minimum until 2028, 2029. At a minimum, if they have Yeah, money. that's under the latest uh, you know, strategic transportation improvement plan. And then there's some plans to improve from Trotter through to 211, uh, yet unspecified turn lanes and so Correct. forth, like at Linden Road and so forth. But there again, they're in the plan to be 2028, 2029. I mean, that's what the STIP says. Um, so there's DOT plans to improve that road to the extent they can. The dilemma is the extent they can. I mean, there's only so many things you can do to that road. Correct. And, and, and to... To, to address that situation, Tanya, just that is a that is a bigger issue as well. That is also aside from just these two small area plans. That is a countywide problem. So yes, it is a problem. It's been addressed as a problem. Those projects with DOT on just without consideration of the the physical and landscape constraints that Highway Five have. DOT has their certain markers that are going to have to hit or be risen to a level before they can really budget and actually move forward and do something. So yes, that is an important issue, but it is such an important issue. It is even outside or greater scope than these small area plans. But as Darren said, what we can do, because we're in this planning process with these areas, we can do what we can, coordinating with DOT and other folks, but to mitigate to the extent that we can, because if we just abandon this process and there's a right to develop and it can happen without regard to traffic or, or anything else, if you check a box based on that base zoning, then we're going to be in even bigger problem. But there's 17,000 plus that feel the same <laughs> right. as you do, I promise you. Well, and I think the other thing is we also, I'll, I'll refer back to the comp plan on that too. We, we have a recommended strategy, come up with strategies to, to try and and address you know, you know traffic congestion on Highway Five, we haven't figured we haven't figured that one out <laughs> yet. We've been trying to hire somebody to help us with that, uh, but we've not we've not gotten that far yet. But there are things that Jack said. There there are lane improvements that that would add that would take out some of the some of the some of that queuing potentially, especially at Morganton. But then we're always going to get caught when you get to the trestle because that narrows it down. You can't make a right hand turn thing without really addressing. The trestle. Then you get north of that, and you got the neighborhoods on either side. So you can't add capacity on that. The only thing that you can do, which I would be opposed to, is they want to potentially put left-hand turn lanes there. 
So if you put left-hand turn lanes, what's going to then happen is you'll always have a constant traffic flow and you'll never be able to get, my concern is you never get a chance to get across Highway 5 because right now when somebody's turning to get on Linden, that creates a big gap uh, for anybody trying to get, a, get across the street from anywhere else. So I'd be, I would be somewhat concerned about that. So just things like that. It's not like people aren't looking at it and trying to figure it out. It is not, it's a complex, it's a complex problem because we are so limited in our ability to, to actually affect a change along the entire corridor. And you see why it's so important when you are planning that you have an appropriate network for transportation so you don't have these issues in the future. But isn't the club wanting... Okay. Nope, it's not on. There you go. You're on. Oh, now you're off. Now you're on. Okay. Um, have, has the DOT not had any input into this or any comments or anything like that or the county county road and just I don't know if the county has a major road plan do they or is it just the state yeah the MC so I'm, I'm just curious is if they've had any comment what was that mm -hmm. or participation I believe Remy Kemp worked with them as part of this this process I, I know they looked at I believe I'm positive that they looked at but they didn't plan. give you any formal feedback on any of it no because we weren't affecting any we weren't we weren't adding roads directly onto highway 5 that would that would add into the, the mix i guess good maybe then they'll respond i mean but we are adding D dot has a plan for all this it takes tremendous and tremendous and tremendous amounts of taxpayer dollars to implement oh yeah it always which does. is why they went broke a year and a half ago um yeah, DOT has a plan for this entire corridor. Uh, the problem is they're constricted by private property owners, and unless mm -hmm. they have more taxpayer money to come up with to purchase that land, there's really not much they can do. But their their big plan might not be the same as our big plan. Mm, that's, that's all I'm saying. They got a seat at the table. I, I think some of our, some of our planning efforts have been devoted to trying to figure out alternatives, you know, alternative alternative mm -hmm. locations. But what what happens within our community? We've got golf courses and private communities that really restrict the amount of cross traffic that you can that you, know, you can move some of this traffic around. DOTs so. across the country have a lot of power, and you know, they're the ones that end up ultimately saying what the land use is going to be like. I mean, they just really do. If they have a major road through there, so I, I'm just. I mean, traffic is visible. I mean, you see it, it's above ground. I mean, is there utility infrastructure enough to support a build out? And then if there isn't, you know, who has to pay for it after, you know, private landowners, I mean, their right to earn a profit on what they have, but who in the end catches it, you know, by taxpayer dollars, which, you know, to put the infrastructure in that should have been put in before you developed it. You know, I would not want to develop land knowing that you're going to have to go in and do an intimate domain case on new construction. You know, so if we're not already putting a corridor for a road widening or whatever it may be into that plan, I think we're probably going to increase the cost from DOT, who is additional taxpayers' money. You know, I think if you looked at Greensboro, I mean, they built an industrial park. They invested a lot of their own money into it. You know, I think Sanford did the same thing, even more locally. You know, I would have to go back, you know, again, I'm not sliding anyone, but if this is Pinehurst's plan, how much money have they spent, other than consultants is to give us, you know, pictures, how much money have they put into infrastructure? You know, because that's the important stuff. And well, then so what is their priority for, for five? I mean, in the overall scheme of things, it might not be a very high priority for them at all. As Philip just said, the, the, they are working on plans for NC5. There, there, there's been, I think they've done a right-of-way plan along there to, to acquire some of the lands uh, for some of the widening. Uh, so the, the DOT... So why are we seeing all <laughs> <So> this? <laughs> those plans. Well, that, that's a, again, that's... But that fits into this. I mean, you can't... I would, it's it's not affecting it's not affecting the land use on either side because it's it's, it's just not at, at this point. It's it, we're not adding. It's not going to affect the base. Well, let's get into the plan and then we can talk about some of the some of those areas where we might be able to focus in a little bit more. I just don't think it's affecting the overall land use scenario uh, 
uh, that's in the plans right now. I just don't. But let's let's wait till we get there. All right. So we got thrown off here just a little bit. Threats and challenges. One of the big challenges that we know is the railroad. The railroad affects the ability. It really affects the land use on the east side because if you're if you're trying to get more re potentially trying to get more retail on the east side, uh, the railroad can be an impediment because nobody wants to wait for a train uh, when the, when they want to get to a a restaurant or things like that. So that's a, that's a potential issue. That's why offices are, you know, in some of those areas, when we have even res residential or office, those two can deal with that a little bit. Uh, the retail, a lot of times, can't. This shows some of the economic and demographic analysis. Uh, this shows just simply that there's about 8,000 people coming in uh, to Pinehurst uh, to work. Or Moore County? No, Pinehurst. Age, age, age and demographics. Uh, this is when we started to look at for sale. Then we started to get into the discussion of the, the various things. For sale residential, as you read in the plan, and as a lot of people know, for sale residential is a hot commodity uh, all over the area. Uh, both Pioneer South and Village Place uh, could support that. And I think you'll, you've seen that in some recommendations. For rent residential, there's some demand out there for that. Retail, there's demand. There's d demand for retail, and there's, there, there's X amount of absorption that we're getting in the market uh, for both retail, uh, retail and office. And again, that's in the plan itself. We don't really need to get to it, but this, this one's office. Office is a little bit weaker. Right now, it's a, it's a little bit weaker than potentially retail, but uh, that doesn't mean that at any moment in time it can't heat up again, because it can. Hospitality, I think you look in the plan, there's, there's some room in the market for additional hotel rooms in the area. Golf, just talked a little about it. it really, is is there is there room for golf? And well, not in any of these two areas as a golf course, but there there are areas that uh, could support a golf uh, potentially a golf cluster. This just gets into the summary. It just shows you know for both the areas, Village Place and Pioneer South, uh, the more the more uh, check marks that you have, uh, the better uh, that land you or the more the hotter that market is. Public outreach, a lot of you know, you participated in the public outreach, the, pu the public workshops uh, that we had on it. You can see various members and sitting around the board and the table right here now uh, that helped inform and guide this process. We did a survey after public workshop one. I think we did a survey after public workshop two. There, there you can see, there, there's your vice chair sitting right there. He was participating in all of them, as was Julia. <laughs> And then recommendations. So, when we started, when they started to look at the recommendations, there was things that got, there was planning principles that were guiding them, and that's really where it gets into here. Create a connected circulation network, and I think you saw, you'll see some of that happening. Incorporate complete streets. Uh, complete streets means that's not just for cars, but it's for bicycles, it's for people walking, things like that, and golf carts. We've been trying for the golf carts. Uh, strengthen building frontage. That means we're trying to create more activity at the at the at the street level. That adds interest, placemaking, uh, uh, character to the uh, to the streetscape. Provide a variety of public open spaces. You'll see that in the plans that we we're showing a, a five to six acre park. We're showing other connected green space. Design streets for flexible programming. That's if you want to be able to maybe shut it down for a block party or something like that. Allow it to have enough space that you're able to do something like that. And then promote uh, health and wellness through neighborhood design meaning you know, connecting to places, creating places for people to walk, things like that. And you can see you know, a lot of what tried to guide some of their, some of the, some of the planning was looking at some of the Olmstead planning principles uh, of, of how you connect places, and how you don't, how they try and shy away a little bit from the, from the block, the typical block that you see a lot throughout the Midwest. So you can see curvilinear streets, things like you know a variety of public open spaces. What do we all love? We all love the Village Green, you know things like that. Trying to create these these smaller blocks and and, and walkable blocks. Uh, this was a concept design when we were showing people uh, when we were showing people in the public uh, 
getting some of the reaction on some of the buildings, some of the street, uh, the streetscape, uh, what a, a public spaces should look like, what we don't like in our commercial buildings, things like that. We actually we were looking at these townhouses that we thought we thought well here's a good example. These are the townhouses that we're uh, that we were showing in. Uh, these are down in Southern Pines right now. Well, they didn't get a very good reaction. So uh, that, you know, we're not going to be promoting any design that has something that looks kind of like that. Party block diagram. This is just, now, when we start to look at all of these, these are all illustrative. They're not set in stone. We're not mapping these roads out. This simply shows how these areas could come together. So as we start to look at it, as, people, as developers start to look at these things and go, Wow, okay, a road was previously thought about being able to go and connect through these areas. So what you're showing is how these blocks could lay out. Party block is simply a vision. It's a, it's a vision of how this area could lay out. And that's it. it. It doesn't set the stage. It's just, it's a preliminary concept that shows how this could actually develop out. So you can see, now you can, you can see from previous where we had all these dead ends. So you're kind of showing, well, this one, So that shouldn't be coming out here. So I don't know why that had. So we'll fix that. I think we did. Uh, but it, but you can see where where the dead ends are, where the streets are connecting through through the area, um, and it just shows how we're better connecting the area. Then what you're also starting to see on this on this map, and this is an old diagram. This is before we changed the park in this area. Um, so you start to look at how we started co to connect the green spaces in these in these areas to try and create a more walkable environment. We showed, and, and when we were doing the Pioneer South Cottages, we got an easement here to the, to the property line to allow for this type of connection. So they're lining up with that. So now we'll get into these are, and these, the plans that you're going to see on the next few pages show some of the original concepts that we had in this area that were out in, I think, public workshop number two. And they've changed between our public workshop number two and the latest, uh, the latest plan, uh, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but you can see how this plan starts to lay out, and you can see the, you can see the buildings that we're showing. Like these are, these, are your, these are your typical office buildings, probably 10 to, to 15,000 square feet, somewhere at that size in here with some smaller ones. You've got, you've got single family detached on the west side. This is a low intensity plan. You've got some attached housing over here. On the west, you've got, we simply showed, I think, single family detached along Monticello. And then to the south, this is your big change. This is the, the change that we'll talk a little bit about in more detail. And you can see the residential to the south is that it, there, we looked at this as one, as one of the plan options in the low intensity. Then we went to the high intensity plan. And high intensity plan simply just added, we went from some single family detached to some single family attached, and you can you can kind of see the the and that was the major changes right here in Piner South. So we were always showing uh, some single family along abutting to the to the Jackson Hamlet neighborhoods to the south. Uh, so they looked at that, and we were trying to be a, a somewhat uh, sympathetic to to the land use to the south. So I think that's why you have some of that residential in there. I know that's why you have some of that residential in there, and to add a variety of housing types in the area. You can see that on the north, we're still maintaining a good amount of office space in this particular area. This previously, I think, had shown residential. Yep, so we're, we were showing single-family residential units along there. High-intensity plan was showing, showing, again, more commercial. So the, the office is uh, up a little bit. Uh, the, the dwelling units uh, count gets up a little bit higher. So before we move on from any of these two plans, you want to you want to you want to talk about this now, or do you want to get? We moved off of the, well. We moved off of this plan, so let, let me move. The, these were the kind of the initial feedback that we, we got some guidance on these two plans, which led up to let's go. We'll go to the preferred plans right now. Here you're see, here you're seeing that that um, that bird's eye view of what this area could look like developed out. And we say developed out. This is not you look at it now, and there's this immediate immediate visceral reaction that this is what's going to happen within the next five years. It's not going to happen within the next five years. It's going to happen within the next 50, probably 25 to 50 years, somewhere there, based on whatever, whatever plan that we come up with. This simply shows the area as it would look like 50 years from, probably 50, you know, 75 years from now, depending on what we're talking about. All the traffic on that diagram. 
There's hardly any cars the, there. The, and NCDOT took care of it. So that is showing in, in 10 years what it's going to be like. Our hover cars. <laughs> Our hover cars are flying over it. Flying over it. You've seen the Jetsons. This, this is two in the morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, this shows, well, I didn't really cover this, but the, we, we, were quite, we were trying to create this core area. And the core area that we're talking about is this area to the north of Blake Boulevard. Here's the Boys and Girls Club, our fire stations over here. So we're trying to create this kind of this core area where you could have a restaurant, where you could have a coffee shop, things like that in this particular area. So we're showing this, this rendering of what, you know, how this area could potentially look. You know, again, some of these are, they're, they're aspirational. We can't, we can't, it, without having some type of incentive or things like that, it's hard for uh, us to make this happen other than providing the incentive through the vision of what could be here. So what it shows is it shows a potential uh, coffee shop in the area, which we've talked to we've talked to one of the property owners who owns this, very interested in something like this. Uh, potentially a restaurant in here, in, in a proposed, uh, proposed office. Uh, this, this site is currently undeveloped right now. Uh, this, as you get into the center, this is that kind of that, that garage building that's sitting there currently showing as potentially a market incubator space, things like that. This got very good reaction from, from one, the property owner, and some of the people that, that I've talked to on, uh, on the community think that this is potentially a good idea for this use. Now it's a matter of, can we make it happen? Do we have a, you know, can it happen? Is all private this is all private. Well, uh, that's a good point. Um, and to go to Paul's uh, comment previously, is that to what extent is the village willing to invest in the infrastructure? Right. And the infrastructure being not just the utilities, but also roads, sidewalks, uh, even though there's no building next to the sidewalk, are we willing to build parks? Are we willing to acquire the land to do all that, hoping that in the future someone will build next to it appropriately? I mean, it re can require a substantial amount of village investment to create this. I mean, to expect that private developers are going to create this, you know, because whatever the reason being, I think is um, a little optimistic. Well, if, if it pencils out, it's got to pencil out. Now, if you put it, if you're putting like we're showing a, a five-acre park down there, there, there's only there's only a couple ways that's going to pencil out. A, if we participate in the form of financial incentive, because if you have to build a road down there and you can only develop one side of the road, uh, you've you've got to make that up on the other side of the road. So you either got to up the density. That's on the other side of the road, or we, or there has to be some type of public-private partnership. They're out there. There's there's economic development tools that are out there that that aren't as actively used. That we, we could look potentially at tax incremental financing, and I don't know how strong. I know that's not a very strong uh, program within the state. I came from an area where I did almost 30 TIF projects where we built roads. We we participated. We did things like that. You're absolutely right. If we want something like this, you have to look at those things. How how is it you know? How can it be profitable for the developer to come in and want to do that whilst also maintaining the vision of what we want for that area as a community? That's a balancing act. And I, is there, there's no formula that I have right now that, that, that can... But it's more than form-based codes. It's, uh, it is, no, the formula. It's, it's an investment in the infrastructure and the, the green field, creating the green field in an appropriate way so that it becomes attractive to develop in the way you want. But it, it also, what you have to have is you, it has to start with a vision somewhere. So we have to have a vision. Otherwise, if you don't have any, any type of vision, you're not going to ever, you're not even going to get close to what's on, on those pages. So what happens is somebody who's potentially interested in, the, in, in this area is going to look at, okay, what are the community, what's the community's idea for what it might want in, in this area? And then, then we start to look at it and start to, well, it, it, I just can't make that work. I can make it work if we do this, if I get X amount of units. Or you, community, do you have any economic development programs uh, that you can potentially, that we could content, potentially uh, partner with you on as part of a public-private partnership? So there are, there are ways out there uh, to, to get what we want, to, to get what the community wants done, but it's all got to start somewhere with a vision of something. And that's what I think these plans do. They do lay out a vision. Uh, for how these areas could develop. Now it's now it's part of the, you know it's up to us to participate if we want to, or if not, if we don't want to participate, then we get we have to figure out. There's still a vision here. There's still a vision that that, that is implementable. Uh, it, it just it's got to make financial sense. I just think you know it's no one more time. 
Okay. Um, the, the village consider, um, I know there's a service area, but I, I take it that's for public works or something like that, but a small service center down there, because it is quite far from here, mm -hmm. all the way down there, in, in one of these little parks here, just a small office that could take care of routine items. You know, oh, things like that. I, that might be an incentive for some of this development. I mean, this, this particular, you're absolutely right on that. I mean, uh, this plan right here, this is a very developable plan because you already have street frontage right on the other side of this retail building. So there's, front, there's frontage right here. So, so you have some infrastructure there. Now where it really comes is, you know, if you want this type of development to get a road, is that a public road, is that a private street? So those are all things that can be worked out. I think on a smaller basis, this is probably easier to implement than when we start to get to those long stretches of roads in Pioneer South. That is where I think you really have to start looking at, well, how, how can we incentivize that? And again, I don't have a pro, I don't, we don't have a program right now for that. If, I think that if there's a desire from the village to have a five acre park, let's say in uh, Pioneer South, they better go buy the five acres now. <laughs> Everything that I've seen in the last five, the four years sitting on this board, there is not a developer who's not maxing out every square inch of ground. You know, so I just don't see it's no one's going to get an investor to give them money to say, hey, I've got 30 buildable acres, but I'm going to set aside five for a park. It just doesn't happen. You're, abs you're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. What was that? Why don't we have these grander visions? I mean, if we're not going to do the park and we're not going to. I'm not that decision maker. Not, that's, that becomes a policy. That becomes a policy decision that's higher up than. than if, that's, if that's truly the goal, I think there should be a recommendation. Hey, go buy five acres in the middle of it right now. As it develops, now you have public space. You can build whatever park you want there. A developer is not going to do it. And, and, and until there's code or law statute that tells him he's going to do it. Right. You're absolutely right. But if, if that park is not in the plan, it's not going to happen in the first place. Yeah. So it, it, it's cart and horse. At least if we, if we have something on the plan. We as the policy, the, the policy makers can start potentially budgeting for it and trying to figure out how that's going to work out. But if that's not in the plan, it's absolutely not going to happen. So if we think it's a bad idea in general, then it should just fall off the plan. Now, the reason that the park that you're seeing on there is on there is because of the input that we got, especially at that public workshop session number two, where people said, you don't have enough parkland. You don't have enough parkland. We want more, we want more green space in Piner South. Now, that, that the green space comes at a premium. Somebody's got to pay for that. And the developer, unless you can incentivize that quite a bit, yeah, you're right. That we've got to figure out how to do that. But you look at these old plans, and you look at what's coming up. They looked at this. We thought yeah, we, created a, a set, we, we created a central green connected area, but that wasn't people wanted more. And that's when we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, create another park for us. And I think they came up with a, with a, with a pretty good idea for a park. Now we can chafe about some of the land use that's around it, and I understand that. Uh, but you know, we did go back, and we did show that park. And again, it's aspirational. We can't make it happen unless, unless, we, you know, unless, a, unless a potential developer wants to look at it and go, yeah, I'd like to put that in, 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 the, in my plan. Uh, how can you participate in that? Has there been any developers who've come in knowing uh, the plans? And saying, "Hey, here's I'm in I'm in line, or I'm in concert with you. I've got investors. Here's what we'd like to do." Not not as of yet. Okay. Not to get into the weeds, but I'm going to. Um, <laughs> so, is there is there a potential? I mean, if if they if you want green space, let's say hypothetically, is there a way to come up with a master stormwater retention plan for the entire area that is one single space that could equal your green space as a pond and green area? And that way it also incentivizes developers because they won't have to worry about stormwater retention. I mean, that you really have to get into the engineering uh, on the development side to know where, where your stormwater is going. The big issue with that is, even our code, we don't allow you to use stormwater ponds as open space because it's, it's not open space. It's, it's, a, it's actually a utility. So, you know, there are you know, things that you want to do generally with a, with a retention basin aren't those things that make it a, make it a a park-like setting in general. Um, so, a couple benches. What was that? A couple benches. A couple benches of ducks. <laughs> yeah. Can it can it be done? 
the only the only where I, the only places that I've seen it done is when I from back home when we were doing when I was when I was planning in Oshkosh we would plan out business parks mm -hmm. and we plan on industrial parks and as part of that process we would do a master stormwater plan for the entire you know 40 to 100 acres so we so that's where all their stormwater went was to these was to these was to larger these, ponds yes yeah. to these and that, that's ponds. what I was saying if there was one I mean. You can do it if they're wet ponds. Just it out there. Yeah, it can be done. And most of the times, sometimes, most of the time, you'll see that with a wet pond. So the wet ponds, you can have that kind of that park-like environment and things like that. Most of the, uh, most of the uh, ones that I've seen down here, I don't think there's too many wet ponds. The, down the, the, soils, not yeah, the, the soils, especially in that area, based on the development has been approved and the infiltration rates that have come through, they are some that engineers have never seen before. The the rates are off the chart in that area for infiltration. Good. So. All right, so let's move on a little bit. We haven't gotten shared use path, but we'll talk about it. Rendering. Here's the detail plan. So this is just this is getting a little bit uh, focusing a little bit uh, lower level uh, than you previously saw, and just shows how the buildings could potentially lay out in this area. Again, illustrative. It doesn't mean this building is going to lay out with this setback at this area, or it's not going to look exactly like this. It shows a general development plan. Uh, of this area, here's here's the Boys and Girls Club. Here's that here's that little coffee shop. Here's that potential restaurant. What they could take advantage of is you know Parker Lane ex actually exists in this area. I think there's some sewer issues down here, but uh, that would have to be worked out. Again, precedent images. What could be in that area? Now you start to see the proposed open space and pedestrian network because you can remember how how Prior to you know, us looking at the planning effort, you can see that there wasn't a lot of, previously there wasn't a lot of, of, of sidewalks in that area. But now you're, we're showing how the area could potentially be, be connected uh, around these two neighbor around the neighborhood. So you can see, and we'll get into Monticello here, you can see that you can, the movement of Monticello potentially to the south. But you can see we're showing sidewalks, paths, whatever we call them, some type of pedestrian facility throughout this area, along with roads, to better connect the area. You can see we're, we're we, you know, we floated this concept of a, a potential path around, you know, a, a potential public services facility, or not, but just to get an additional walking path in that area. So you can see it's pretty, it, it is pretty connected. You can see this path between the two two developments over here. You can see paths over here. There's a potential way you could potentially connect up from Trotter Hills over to Lake Hill. So there's, and there's, we have this five to six acre park down here that's, that's Village of Pinehurst open space. So you can see we, could, we are showing a, a well-connected area. Any questions on, on this? I think when we approved the cottages, wasn't it a sidewalk only on one side of the street, not two? It is. I think they're, I think that are they putting a sidewalk? In? Where's Alex? Are you going to leave? No. I, I think, well, the code, the code only requires you to have it on one side. So it's either on one side, but it just shows whether it's on. It's just showing that it's connected. Okay. That the, the important okay. part on, especially that's it's, a scale, is that it's a, it's showing the connection. The real important one I thought was this was this potential connection here because now you're not you can get out through this development and you know potentially hit this area and walk this way. So I think this it, it does do a good job of connecting the area. They sold it as a walkable community and. I remember, right, we asked where you're walking to. There's mm -hmm. nobody to go there. We did. <laughs> well, you're going to walk to something over here. We'll figure out where that, what that's going to be soon. For clarity, the shared use path, is that going to be golf cart, bike, oh, run? No. Well, I don't, we haven't, it hasn't been designed yet. So we don't, we, in order to get a golf cart, you got to get, the, you got to get the appropriate amount of width. So it depends on how much width that we could actually get to do that. Or is there better, or is there other alternative connections that we can make to get there? I think the primary goal of this of the shared use path is at the very least bikes, right? Bikes and pedestrian. And I think you know this shared use path. Well, again, it's not designed yet. We haven't been there. It's the concept. Uh, the railroad has been has been open to the concept of a shared use path, and I can tell you to have an open an, a willingness to talk to you as part of a railroad. Or something like this. This is not. It's done in other parts. It's done in other parts of the state. Rails with trails is a thing. So it's actually done. It's, it's done in North Carolina across the, across the country. But different railroads have different, you know, quirkiness about what they'll allow. So we're we were very happy 
that just the concept of this uh, was something that they were open to. Now it comes to us if we really have the, you know, can we design it, can we implement it? Those things have, have yet to come, but the concept, can you imagine, you know, having this connection all the way up to, to at least the trestle and all the way down to one? There's a lot of, there's, there's a lot of path that we, that we could create, so I think it's a great idea. Just out of curiosity, do we know um, what their right of way is? Yeah, the right of way width varies. It varies greatly. I mean, in some places it's well over 100 feet. Some places it's narrow. Some places the state road is on it, so it, it's, it varies. Okay. The wider the better if you're trying to get a shared use path, though. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a screen capture of, of, the, uh, of the bird's eye aerial view that shows the shows the potential park, shows the land use around it. So just showing how this could fit into a neighborhood. Again, you know, you're talking a lot of years. Here's, here's kind of a concept that we were thinking. Here's a shared use path. So I forget. Gives me a break to take a breath. <laughs> it gives me to take a breath. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Um, so here, number four is showing kind of a concept of what a shared use path could look like. This is, this is obviously probably in a, in a more urban area, I would think, but you can see how, the, how there's an active train coming through here. You have this fence to try and keep people, you know, from crossing over into the track. So this is kind of what, what the concept of a shared use path is. Doesn't mean that's going to look like what anything that we would do would look in practice. Look at the concept, the separation between the people utilizing the path and the railroad itself. That is one of the most important things to the railroad is to not have this open, even though it's open right now, and you can cross over it right now virtually anywhere, uh, they want to try and keep, you know, if they do anything, they would like to have some type of fence there just to try and keep that connection. But here you can see this is probably a 10-foot shared use path. So 10 foot is what you want for 10 to 12, I think, is what you want for anything that has bicycles on it. The wider would, would be for a golf cart. I don't know how wide you have to get because those get up to 20-some miles an hour, 20, 25, and they can be moving. So you don't want them that close to that traffic. Is, do you know if that path that um, goes from Morganton North next to the railroad, which is a golf cart, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. is that on uh, Country Club? No, I think that I... Because it's I very close to, that's why I was asking about the... the no, I don't... I, close to the railroad. I'm not sure. I think that that might even meander in and out a little bit. So I think some of it might be on, on the railroad property, some of it might be on Piner's property. Yeah. Just curious. Here is that open space detail plan of, of that park. So here you can show, so we went back to the drawing board from what was there before and we came up with the concept of a park. So you can see that, you know, the park has some facilities in it. It's got, you know, and the, again, illustrative. This shows what could be here. Community, potentially community gardens that people have been, uh, people have liked those things. Multi-age playground with uh, different equipment in there. I think we have some precedent images in there. Uh, kind of a lawn event potential space. Could put a potential community type center down here, which could be anything. Uh, pick a, a pavilion and picnic area, outdoor fitness, well-connected, you know, well-connected area. Land uses around it. So you've got, you know, again, I know that the, we're going to have a little bit of discussion on it, but you have the you have these kind of commercial office spaces to the north, and then we are transitioning it down uh, to can be single family attached, can be single family detached. I think what we liked with the concept of this is we try and uh, I think some of the elements of Walker Station are within this within this particular concept with having you know some green spaces, uh, things like that, but they don't have this they don't have any of this commercial or retail stuff that's up here to walk to. So that was kind of the concept. I think the other concept was if we were going to actually put a park in this area, I think the thought is that if you put a park here, do you, if this land use changes, so, so you see these illustrations, if we change, if we move all these illustrations down, move it all down to, to the south, to the line down here, which is where it's down here is where the, the Jackson Hamlet community is along, along Arnett, that is there, is there a need for, is there actually a need for this park in this area if the land use is not going to be residential, because residential is usually the ones who are taking advantage of the parks, unless you're in a city like, you know, some huge city like, you know, downtown St. Paul or something like that, um, that, you know, residential are going to be the users. Uh, so do we change, if, if the land use changes down here, 
uh, then is there really a need for even this park in this area? So, so you're, you're implying that a large community park in this area is not appropriate unless it's uh, associated with the residential around the park. That's what, no, you, just, I, I no, I, that's what I, you just said. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not appropriate. I'm saying is that land use, is the land use here going to take advantage, really going to take advantage of a park being in that area? Does, it, does that land use serve more the offices or does it serve more residential? And just from a... Well, is there a need within the village of Pinehurst for additional park space? That's, we have a plan for that that they're working on right now, too. I don't have that answer because that plan hasn't been developed yet. Right. Uh, now, at, at first glance, I mean, we don't have a lot of small neighborhood parks in this community. We, we hear some of that, that there would be like to be more smaller neighborhood parks. But again, we haven't, that, that planning effort is underway right now. Uh, could, a plan, could it work there? Sure. It always can work here. You always, when you're looking at land uses, you're looking at, Who's going to who's going to benefit by that land use? If it's a if it's a regional park, yeah, I think you're you're probably right. It could work. If it's a small neighborhood park, does that smaller neighborhood park work in that location with those land uses? I'm not a park planner, so I'm not you know I'm not going to I'm not going to claim otherwise. Uh, but if you put this pattern, if you put this pattern down here, do you really do you need the need this park as a neighborhood park? That's the question. I, it, again, how does how, how do you pay for it? That's a, that's another one of those questions. Here was the concept of the park itself when we had the you know you could have a pavilion in it. You could have this. You know, here, here could be a potential. You see a water feature. And there you go, Philip. This is not really a stormwater that's feature. Exactly, that's what I'm talking about. Like, but, put a but, couple signs up. Something like risk. that. Yeah. So we were thinking something like that. You got this, uh, and then you got community garden. So that, these were kind of the concepts that could be that could be incorporated in, into such a park. Again, if it's, if it's going to be a, a larger regional park, then you, you might be able to draw more than a, than a smaller neighborhood park. But then again, I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a park planner. All right, traffic. Uh, traffic. One thing that we know, this, this, what this map shows, or what this chart shows, is when you see a bunch of Ds and Es and Fs and C, it, it, that means that there's congestion. So at, at certain times of the day along, NC5, it's it's very severely congested. You can see that the, the, there are some Bs. A to B is good. C is you know it's going to be average. But once you get into the Ds and the Fs, that's where that's where you know you're you're starting to get uh, severe congestion. <coughs> to to reopen that can of worms a little bit, do, where are people going and coming from for the most part with traffic studies? I mean, so if if all the congestion on five are they are they going out to two eleven, going down to one? Maybe she's. Down to I can the, take my golf cart there now. To the school, that new school, that's created a lot. I think it's a lot of local traffic. I, the last thing I, when, when we were using some data, I think a lot of it was local traffic, but I haven't looked at, I haven't looked at the. It's the mostly data. local traffic. There's a huge amount of data available, and it's um, gathered from phone data. You know, they track uh, individual cell phones as to where, when they enter a certain sector and they where they go. Uh, and uh, I think that the proof has been that the, most of the traffic on five in particular in Morganton is local traffic. Uh, I tell you the truth, if you go out to the Olmstead, uh, you know, the Harris Teeter uh, thing out here, I would say that a third of the cars that come down Route 5 and take a left on 211 take a right into that development or that uh, shopping center. So it has proven to be mostly local traffic, which is why the, um, the concept of a, uh, a bypass you know, the Western Bypass has never received a lot of favor from NCDOT because they don't see any data that supports that. Which then opens up the conversation of do we need any high-density housing because it's only going to compound the problem. Right. That's int I find that interesting, well, Jack, not debating with you, but I find it interesting it's local traffic because it seems like a thoroughfare, that. you know, from 1 to um, 211. But I just don't, I mean, I'm... Of course, the question is what's local, but I mean, yeah, uh, sure. uh, I mean, from uh, I would say Seven Lakes, you know, to Aberdeen, uh, the traffic is generally in that area. Very few people are going from Seven Lakes to the other side of Aberdeen, uh, so it's considered local, I guess, because their okay. either their arrival or departure is a local location, if that makes sense. Yep, thank you. 
then the area is going to continue to grow. The whole region is going to, it, it continues to grow. So you, there's going to be more trips, not just added locally, but, but we are developing out in, in, in other parts of our of our gr growth area. But those other those other areas continue to expand as well within the county. So if you get to north towards Carthage, you get out towards Seven End or Seven Lakes West End. Those areas continue to grow. You might, well, within a half a mile of the area we're talking about are two. Uh, single-family developments going up uh, and being built out, which are, I mean, they have a, quite a ways to go, actually, to yeah. build out. So um, expect more. There will be. There's no doubt. We, we have vacant developable land. You can't lock it down. Unless, no. You know. No one said you should. No. All right. Shared use path, traffic impact. This, again, gives the trip gen is, is, is a basic. You're look, trip gen is a science, so you're looking at square footages. You're looking at a basic, uh, a basic calculation of if it's commercial, if it's residential. There's a, there's a number that gets that gets put on that. All this leads to there's going to be there, anything that we do is going to lead to more trips. Now, there's different land uses that develop different higher amounts of trips. It's there, it's just all depending on some land uses, commercial offices. No retail probably has the most trips. Then it goes down it goes down the line to less intense land uses. Proposed circulation plan, so we're kind of back to this. Um, was, it, was there any questions on the proposed circulation plan itself? Jack, you can see that we, it doesn't come all the way through here, which, I, which we had thought on that one, but it doesn't come all the way through. So this is the, you've seen this several times, so this shows the, this just shows the proposed, potentially, street layout where we had the long discussion on, you know, if we want it, do we want to incentivize it? Do we want to do we want to, do we want to financially incentivize this to happen? That becomes a policy decision. It really does. So, any any questions, recommendations on this particular? We're going to get into the recommendations, but any any other questions on this? I know we haven't really talked about this whole Monticello realignment yet. Um, so we're putting that route to the harness track. Is that new? This. Yeah. No, this road, this road currently exists. It's a dirt road. It's a dirt road. Yeah. It potentially, if, if, the, if the public services facility is potentially located here, you'd have to, you'd have to put some type of improved, not, not a general purpose road, but you have to put some type of private road to service that area. Let's get down to one other thing. A, a portion of that path into a different area is. Oh, you're right. It's right over here, isn't it? Is it? Is is going to be improved here very soon. There's a. There's a driveway though. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's get to the detailed rendering, Sonia. Keep holding it. We'll get back to it. All right. So here's the here's the kind of the design of that shared use path. So it just kind of shows here's the existing conditions on the left. Here's what a potential path could look like. Again, there's always going to be concerns about you know what are we doing to you know try and separate the traffic if we can, trying to get as much buffer as we can between the path. But you want to get as much buffer between the path and the railroad and the path and, and, and the moving traffic as you can. So you can see up here what this is what the current situation looks like. This is what it could could potentially look like. Potential. Here's just showing potential street sections. If we're going to if we're going to build streets, uh, be the be the whole complete streets philosophy. You know, travel lanes, parking lanes, have enough enough lanes for enough width for sidewalks, enough for that planting area so we can get the trees and the appropriate landscaping that we want in the, want in those particular areas. It's not exciting, but. So there would be two, you know, two, two separate ones. There would be a, a, a commercial street section and a residential street section. Residential is going to be just a little bit narrower because you don't need as much on a residential street section as you do in a commercial street section. All right, now the fun part, uh, the build-out scenarios. These were the, the last uh, discussion points that we had had, I think, last, uh, I think it was last fall, uh, that kind of led up to this 
where we are on the proposal for these plans. So there are two, there are two sets of uh, scenarios. One is the low and the other is the high scenario. Uh, you can see here with the low scenario, uh, we still have the park. In, in both, in both uh, renditions, we still, we still have the park. Uh, we have residential. You can see residential, single family, detached, kind of running around the south, east, and west of that park. North, you'd have your proposed commercial offices, flex use, um, it's so almost like an incubator. You have residential, you could have residential single family as a low use over on the west side. Again, they're showing it on, on the west side of the, uh, of the road, some single family would detach. Not showing, there's not a lot of development potential along uh, Highway 5. That's why you know, we didn't really, we didn't really deal, you couldn't deal too much with 5 because we're not really showing any, any real street connections or anything to 5. What's going to happen along five is you're going to see an infill development pattern happen along five. So it's just going to it's just going to fill in. We just got to make sure we have the appropriate amount of setbacks. Uh, that and I think one of the proposals that you'll see is we don't want any parking if we can help it between the building and the street itself, or or at least not on the front side, but maybe on the, on the back side of the building or side side of the building. So this is the low intensity. Uh, so in the low intensity, we're just showing Monticello in the same place. So if it stays, this is how it could potentially develop. It could potentially develop with single-family houses. The current zoning would allow uh, for offices in here as well. And then you move down to uh, the proposed higher, higher intensity. And higher intensity is going to be more square footages. We're showing single-family attached along, uh, along the, where you previously saw a single-family detached, still showing you can see we're still showing uh, the commercial space to the north between Blake and, and the park itself. You can see that there's a difference here. You can see this, uh, Paul, this is kind of how, how it was going to lay out with uh, Pioneer South Cottages to the east. You can see the connections that we have in the area. Uh, again, the park, the well, again, it looks like a well-connected park, park plan or open space plan for, the, for this area, showing some potentially if we relocate uh, Monticello to the south, then you have some room to, to potentially uh, put some offices, office type buildings along Monticello in that area. Um, you got that. Anything else on these plans that are really too much different? No. I mean, it's more multiple family on this side. So those are the, that, that's the two main parts of the plan. And I, I, Guess we should. I want to get back to some of the discussion points on, on the plans itself. First of all, let's let's handle uh, Sonia's question on the public services complex, uh, po complex. It's nothing but a potential right now. So they're 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 looking at various options uh, to relocate the public services facility. They've been looking at it for a number of years. That's why they bought land years ago on Juniper was it Juniper Juniper Lake Juniper Lake uh, some lands out there. Uh, they're also looking at other locations than just potentially. You know, potentially the harness track. They're looking at potentially splitting the operations up. Do, do you do you want to put something closer to the landfill for, uh, because we have to run a lot of garbage trucks down there? Do we separate the operations? Nothing. None, none of that has been done. I think uh, I think administration is still looking at other potential locations. So the only thing that is right now is it's a potential locations for it because it doesn't. Whether we have this plan or not, it's still a potential location. It still has to be. That's a policy decision that still has to be made you know, at the at the council level. You have to. <laughs> I think they need to and size it too, as far as the money. That goes. too. I mean, they they haven't done any of that. So all all this is a concept right now. There, we. I think the way we size it with 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 the Monticello movement to the south, I think that got us up to like eight acres. I think the existing facility is what sitting at seven plus acres, or yeah, something something like that. So we wanted to make sure that if potentially it was going to locate down there, that we'd have potentially enough area to create a strong buffer around that. So it's it's mostly there for buffering purposes. Right. And, That's and, it. And the pro is that you can find the space maybe if you reallocate or if you readjust uh, mm -hmm. Monticello. Mm -hmm. And the con is that is it appropriate to have a semi-industrial type of facility uh, close to what you're hoping to be a, a premier business location and close to other residential areas. That's the yeah. con. So I assume that council will figure that out. Yes. Again, it's nothing more than a concept now. It'll be, 
if we pulled that bubble off that says potential VOP area, still exists as a potential without that bubble in place. But so is it going to stay in here like a, a recommendation from us that this go here? You're going you're gonna to let me know that in about as soon as we get through this process. Because at some point, like I said at the last time, these plans are going to be in front of you, and we're going to be asking you for a recommendation on these plans. Now, you provided me some, you provided us some guidance on the village place. We're going to want that, we're going to want that same guidance on this. This is what, this is what, you know, we bring in, in, in here for, to have these discussions on, to provide the recommendations that will eventually be taken up by, by the village council. If there's something that absolutely you don't want in here that, that you think is a horrible idea, make that recommendation. Well, well relative to moving the, um public services, I think it's wise to understand completely what is the public services function and what is in that uh, function. I mean, it's one thing to say public services, but you need to describe that. Maybe it's garbage we're, trucks. Right, we're storing garbage trucks. We are, in fact, at least currently, we're storing uh, material uh, used for road and other maintenance. We're storing vehicles. We're doing vehicle maintenance of both uh, vehicles and trucks, uh, you know, so we, it's wise to understand exactly what's involved in the public services function before you say whether or not it makes sense to, to move it into that area or not. Well, the other, the other part of the equation is they're, they're looking at potentially splitting it too. So that none of, you know, so you're right, you, you probably, we probably have to better explain what that function looks like, at least as part of this process, because you know, there's questions. So right. yeah, we can certainly, we can answer that question. That's that. I think that's a relatively easy. Yeah, I think to council down. should you know go across the street here and, and and walk through the public services function and see what is involved in uh, in performing the public services function and what needs to be in that location in order to uh, service both the uh, solid waste and the police department vehicles and the other vehicles and uh, and all the rest of the functions that go on in there. And I imagine. And, and they can envision that, whether that makes sense to have that type of traffic and or function in this location. I, I think that requires a little more study. Well, the other, the other thing that you'll, you'll have, you know, once you look at it, I think a lot of that's probably grown organically over the years versus a site that you can actually, yeah, you can purpose plan for that potential use. So mm -hmm. there's going to be, I think you have to understand the uses, yes. But looking at it, I think you can replan and, and re you can plan it out for, you know, I got eight acres. How do I fit all these uses on those eight acres? So right. point well taken. But, but, I, but Jack, and that was my concern, and that's why I had the question, why are you going to add more traffic moving that to there or part of it there? I mean, you're going to have the garbage trucks, the police, whoever, whatever you're planning on doing, or the parking for the vehicles. Those are all extra cars when we've already got congestion going on. So why, why are we... We as a village adding more congestion. Because I don't know that the plan we have for the village up here works without getting it out of here. Well, but it, it's it's gotta somebody go somewhere. just say there's some <laughs> land on Juniper. I mean, it's Juniper Lake. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So why can't I mean, we look it, at that more? Uh, well, but there's procedures. A lot of wetlands out there too. There's a what? There's some wetlands out there that have to be dealt with as well. Of course, you got the lake at the front there by the post office that flooded the road the other day. Yeah, but then if you got the Juniper Lake, then you're talking about bringing trash trucks through the village all the time versus having them on the south end driving straight down Logistically, the Logistically, that site just... Yeah. I, I think w the only thing that the plan is doing at this point is it's recognizing the current potential of this and going, you're asking the questions. Jack said it wonderfully. He said, do you want this use over by what we're trying to promote as high end office use. It's a valid que it's a valid question to ask. It's a valid question to start looking at the potential uses around and going, yeah, will that fit? You have you have the retirement center over there. That's why we wanted to have the larger buffer. I think we're trying to get like a hundred foot wide buffer in that area if that would work. But you ask a great question. It needs to be it needs to be considered. So if we're really looking at that, we know we need it to implement village place, but if it does ultimately go down here, it's appropriate to show it on this plan because it currently exists. It currently exists as, I keep saying it, it currently exists as a potential. So we have to, we should be considering that. This plan is not making it happen, 
this plan is, is reacting to that potential of it being there? There's no question it's an option. Uh, I think it requires a huge amount of additional study. Yeah. Uh, I'm that. not sure we're, quite honestly, I'm equipped to, uh, mm. to even recommend one way or another. I don't think as a group, no. That's correct. I mean, you're absolutely correct. I think a lot of work to figure that one they're, out. They're, I mean, I know they're looking into that right now, but they're looking at And it may not team. change the rest of the plan either, because it's on the periphery in a way, because mm -hmm. you know, it's on the harness track side. Yeah. The, 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 major, the major thing about this plan is potentially that relocation of Monticello. So if we don't move, if we don't move, you know, Monticello, what does that do to the plan for moving the public service facility out there? What it does is it probably just, it, it, it shrinks up the buffers that could potentially be around something like that. To do that, you'd have to, um, you'd have to gather in the five or six lots that are currently bordering the Monticello. You are correct. Yeah, you'd have to, you have to uh, you have claim to those. Some, yes, you have to do some acquisition. You are correct. Yeah, acquisition is right. You are correct. So. Again, the plan Good doesn't. We're showing we're showing it on the plan as a potential. It does not make it happen. Okay, but you know, <laughs> we're laughing. But um, <laughs> you just made that statement a little while ago about this is already the way it is for whoever voted on this way back. Well, don't forget if we're going to vote on it, are people going to say in 15 years? Oh well, you know, the board in 2022 voted on this. So keep that in mind when we're talking about this. It happens there. It, it happens every turnover. Every time you turn something over, the, the, previous, the previous people can take, you know. Of course. Of course, yeah. but we are in a different time mm -hmm. zone now than we were when this was, you know, not this. I don't know that. There. So. The, the other concern that I've heard uh, about this plan, whether it be the low intensity or high intensity, is the concept of residential in this area at all. And, and, and you understand that. Um, yep. Talk Whether we're going to promote this as a place we really want to uh, have businesses move to and or whether we want to give in to the most current uh, cause du jour, which is residential is hot. And that's what the market analysis said. And you could sell it off right away we could. Uh, or whether we're going to hold the line and try to make it something that we could possibly make it. That, that, that's the I've heard that quite often. No, and, and I've heard it too. And we should let's talk. Let's let's spend some time talking about. It. Is, is there any any because this is going to talk? This will probably delay us for at least a half hour. So <laughs> <laughs> so so is there anything else about these particular plans that we're that we're looking at right now that you want to get to before we get into that main little crux of the issue? Regardless of what plan you go with, even if it's not one of these two plants, high density, low density, I mean, you're going to have to force zoning changes, yes. right? Okay. Is is that the purpose of where we're going to yes. right now? Yes. And if yes. you want, and if you want public space, someone's going to have to make a decision to apply public money to purchase public space. No. No. No, because what what, what happened? The underlying velocity of the developer is going the, to the underlying value. zoning is not going to. When, when we start to do, make some of the zoning changes and say we don't want to park there, we're, we're, we can't just simply zone it PC for a park for public conservation. We can't. We we can't do that. So when we make the underlying zoning changes, the underlying zoning changes are going to are going to allow what type of use we want in this area. So if it's only commercial, if it's only mixed use, if it's residential. That will be on the underlying zoning. That will be a, that will be in that area, or that will be the building form. We can't just say it's going to be a public park because that then becomes. We can't just zone something and, and take away all property rights from you. you. You can't. You can't do that. So again, when I talk, talk about that public-private partnership, the plan sets the stage for that. But when we start to do implement the changes, we still have this. We still got to contend with the base zoning. There's going to be a base zoning that's going to allow it. So we're showing a park in there. It's also going to have a base zoning to it. Right now it's NC. So if we if we did any zoning changes and we put an overlay in it, the underlying zoning is still going to be on, still going to be a neighborhood commercial, and it's going to allow all those various uses. You're going to we're not ask. we're not there we're not there yet. I need we need to get through this. We need to we need to get to some consensus on this before we can start talking about. All right. What what should the what should this area look like? Because 
If this area is going to now change, which is change is fine, I just need to know about it because we're gonna we're, we'll have to fine tune some of the underlying zoning uh, to it. So let's talk some more. Let's let's talk about this this residential as, as a group and see where I want to know what your thoughts are on it. I can tell you that some of the thoughts that I think that were in place when this got started to get put together is when we looked at you know there's a comprehensive plan goal to want to create a diversity of housing in the community. We've, we've talked about having a diversity of housing sizes and types. I think that plays a little bit into it. It's not just the market. It was also looking at the amount of square footages that, uh, that, that we are showing in, the, in this area and the, kind of the absorption rate. And we, so we took a look at that. And then I think they just took a look at creating, you know, trying to create that mixed use environment. So I think a lot of that went into the decision making uh, to put some uh, to put residential in here and also the other thing was to be a little bit more sympathetic to the folks down here on Jackson Hamlet because we were going up against a developed residential subdivision and you're dealing with a residential subdivision over there so I think all those factors kind of played into it now if, if you change it all to one thing mixed use office you know things like that we can do that I just need a recommendation and I can make and I can we can make the adjustments and we'll fine-tune the zoning to make sure that happens. Well, the logic that I've heard is that there is precious little space in uh, the village of Piners, at least within our municipal limits, for, um, for office and or professional. There really is very little. Uh, and um, sh we shouldn't really give in to the heat of the moment and apply residential to the, to the very precious area that we have that could potentially have office. And professional and maybe some local locally serving retail and so that's why the alarm as to inserting uh, residential in this area came about and I think it made sense I mean it seems that office professional is there is some vitality in office professional look at Trotter Hills it is in fact building out and building out its zone professional office professional right so it is building out according to kind of the plan and so it shows that there is demand of some nature for office and professional um, in this general area. And so that's why the concern about inserting residential and using up valuable space that could be office professional with, uh, with residential. The demand, and just one th thing to add to that is, is, is our actual demand in the area is probably five to 10,000 square feet a year. Not today, maybe, but who knows? I agree with you, Jack. What concerns me is there is this pressure to have more residential and I don't want it in the ETJ that is currently at you know five acre parcels single family homes and at, at some point that's going to look attractive um, so we're, we're balancing concerns and while we're looking at just this area right now we have to think about where where pressure is going to overflow eventually. And that, that is something I think it would be a shame if we lost our sense of place and lost that, that green horse country that we have precious little of. You're going to have to have mixed use because the traffic's going to be so bad you're not going to be able to drive anywhere, so you're going to have to walk. Or ride a horse. Now, you know, with this pathway, it just occurred to me, who's paying for this pathway? The developers are going to pay each piece? Developers, we can, we can, we had, we can make, we can make the pathways as part but of the are we are. We, we are. We, I mean, we do it with sidewalks right now with the development process. We might have to make some changes to the zoning, uh, but right now, when you're coming through as, a, as part of a site plan, we make you put a, site, a, a sidewalk in front of your properties. So we do it now. So we just have to figure out a way to... Well, we've had many discussions on that yes, we over have. the last couple of years, and we we've have. allowed Presbyterian Church not to put a sidewalk. We we've allowed other people, and I and my point has always been: we know we're going to put a sidewalk there, and the developer or the landowner should do it because later in the day it'll be the taxpayers who do it, mm -hmm. and we will we'll have no benefit for the, you know. Ellis Chapel, I think, was yeah. one of those we had. Right. I mean, so we just need to figure out if we can. If it's a true pathway versus a sidewalk, we have to look in, into those logistics of whether, you know, how much we can actually require and if we can potentially have to change our, our, our PDO to, to make that happen. Because there's different rules, you have different rules down here than the Muse did 
from where I came from. Well, yeah. So we, we just ordered it in, and we would just order it in, and we'd assess you for it. We don't do that down here. So Focusing on land use in this particular area for now, uh, besides the concern that I've heard about residential being inserted here and not being preserved for professional, I've heard a, uh, quite a bit of positive statements about providing open space in this area. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, you did mention that it's of little value to have a park unless you have residential next to it. I'm not sure that's the case. I think that a, a park of some nature surrounded by an uh, office professional could be of, of some value to the community. Yeah, I agree. agree with that, agree. Chair. I didn't say it was little value. I said it doesn't, it doesn't benefit as greatly for, than do the residential folks. That well, I wouldn't have a playground in that park necessarily, but but a park of some nature that uh, would serve to enhance that neighborhood would be It depends. Useful. It really depends on the kind of park. Right. Because you think about the park that's currently, um, you know, in, in motion off of Chicken Plant. Not that many people live off of Chicken yeah. Plant. So, but it is a park that serves the community around where I live. And I have to get in my car and go drive to it. But then I can do the Frisbee golf thing or go for the walk or whatever. So it, it has, but that is a, uh, as is being envisioned as what you might think of as a destination park, you know, with uh, facilities that people are going to travel to to make use of. If we're talking about just a nice area to take a walk, then you really do need neighborhood around it where people would want to go and throw a frisbee or take their dog out, you know? So it's, it's a question of what kind of park. And the size. I'm sorry. Better there. Hey, I, 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 <laughs> if I get my theater anywhere, I will be delighted. That would be a great So <laughs> no problem. But how, Although we can take advantage of the slope there for the amphitheater, so. How big is West Piners Park? It's got to be over, is it over 20 acres? Yeah. So, you know, when you're looking at, you're looking at, that's a regional park. So, yeah, you can put all those different facilities in it. On the five-acre piece, you know, it's a matter of what can you fit in that five acres. But that doesn't mean it doesn't have to be five acres. Somebody could buy, you could buy the whole thing and turn it into another regional park. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just putting, I'm just, I'm just saying that. So. Just out of curiosity, because you know, Johnny come lately, just does the village own any land in here? No, the bill, not that I'm aware of. We only own the, the harness track, right? What? Oh, we own, we, own the, we own the harness track over here. Besides that. And we own this green, we own, own this green space on this side. But it's outside oh, the planning. That area. It's outside the planning area. Alex is, cor Alex is correct. So there's really, this is all pretty much privately owned in this particular area. But let's move back to the discussion on housing. Let's get on the table, Jack. I mean, you've raised some points that I've heard as well. Um, Go around and talk a little bit about it. Uh, Jack, Jack is one who's... who's low density. Who's, <laughs> well, really, do we want residential or do we want residential or do we want only commercial in, in this particular area? And it's a really important question because when we move forward, I just need to know because right now, no res, right now, currently no residential is allowed in that area, right? No single family, no, no, um, no, no single family is allowed. I'm not sure about single family detached. Multiple now multiple families allowed. The only thing that's allowed is mixed use. Mixed use would be allowed in both of these setups. I think live work might work in the NC, or is that just me? I'm not sure right now. Um, so, but it really becomes an important question because whatever we follow up with to implement this, I need to know because we're going to need to adjust the, the underlying zoning to make that occur. So, whether there's residential here or whether there's not residential here, I'm going to need a recommendation from you all because I'm going to. We're going to end up changing these. If I have to change these plans, we've got to, I got to pull those boxes off and change the potential. You know, that, the boxes show a potential land use. They don't establish density. They don't do anything like that. But it shows a type of, a type of building type. These are simply showing, these are showing attached single family. Right? So that's attached single family. This shows detached single family. Both of these aren't allowed under the current zoning. So I need a recommendation from you all, again, that's going to go to the council. Well, so we do we believe that this golf-centric concept of uh, multiple businesses wanting to be in the area and needing space uh, or building uh, buildings or, or whatever uh, is real enough to, in fact, preserve space for it? 
I mean, your point is well taken, Jack. I mean, it, it is. I mean, I think, I think Phillips had this discussion. We've had this discussion. It, it, it has access to Highway 5. It's going to add trips, just so we all know. Everything we do is going to add trips. So it's going to add trips. But it, it, it is a potential. It could here. I mean, you've got, we're showing, what are we showing? 200,000 square feet of potential office in this, in this particular area. So if you add that, you, you're, if, you, if, you, if you retain the park, you could probably add, what, another, another 75 to 100,000 square foot of office. So yeah, you, you can do it. It's, 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 a, it's a concept that can happen. So it's a matter, do we, do we want this concept for this entire assemblage of area? That's all. Yeah, I would say the conversations are very real now. You know, if they don't come to fruition, I don't want to be crucified either publicly. No, no. <laughs> so... Um, the conversations are real, yes. Um, yeah, I think we need a place for additional, I'll call it office, call it f professional flex space, whatever you want to flavor you want to put on it. Um, the need is real. Uh, the conversations are happening more and more frequently. Um, yeah. See, that's, and, that, and that's what we need to hear. That's why we have, I, I think that's why we, we're having this discussion. It's not like we're a rust belt, you know, and the, and the only industry has moved out of town and we're financially in d deep straits and we gotta, we got to find something uh, to increase our revenue. I mean, we have the option of getting what we want, in my opinion, and the question is, what do we want? I think Could all it? we have to do is go to Raleigh and look at some of the mix, mixed-use communities. They're very popular. I mean, there's everything that you need. I mean, uh, you know, and I, there's a variety of detached single families you know, with multifamilies. I mean, I, you know, you go into places of Europe where they've kind of done some redevelopment. You know, they're, I mean, a, a family basically can do everything they need on a bike or walking. You know, I, so I would say, I mean, that's not the neighborhood I would live in, you know, but I would certainly say that that is very popular and I think really very appealing to many. A mixed use neighborhood. In the professional, if we go that way, you can still, could you still have restaurants and things? Mm -hmm. Yes, everything. That would solve some of those. Up or whatever. Amphitheater. Amphitheater. Well, except nobody's going to go, well, I shouldn't say nobody, because if there are offices, they'll take advantage of a coffee shop. Um, go to the post office? You can stop by the coffee shop. Uh, no, um, but it things neighborhood businesses are not going to want to be where there is not a neighborhood, um, in my mind. So something like a, a ice cream shop, the ice cream shop in Southern Pines works because people go to that area. There's a density of um, uh, of shopping, there's a density of uh, restaurants, and there are homes nearby. Um, so neighborhood businesses need a neighborhood. Then there are businesses that are things that we commute to, um, like the orthodontist. You don't need to walk to your orthodontist. Um, so I guess it might be nice, but it's not typically done. So I mean, our question, I think, before us is, are we trying to create a neighborhood of, you know, a mixed-use neighborhood like Paul was describing, or are we trying to create something different? And if we're trying to create something different with offices, then I don't think we should kind of kid ourselves into thinking that you can create both at once. I, I have to back Jack on this because we don't have a lot of business spaces and businesses are not coming here. They're going to go to Southern Ponds and Aberdeen and everywhere. There's plenty of room. So for a tax base, eventually, don't you want to have those businesses? Well, and what business do you think we're going to come here? Um, you know, they're going to be maybe a medical office building like when I have down Southern Pines. I mean, yeah, they're going to be probably very, uh, none of them are going to be industrial. They're just going to be office space. And I think, I think some mixed use do have, you know, you've got one floor of, uh, you know, retail, whether it be orthodontist, dentist, or ice cream. Mm -hmm. I guess the dentist and the ice cream would, that would be important <laughs> to have both those there, especially for kids. Um, you know, next, 
Next row could be some office space, uh, law, law firm, um, you know, healthcare, you know, administrative type stuff, you know, investment firm, and then you've got some uh, living space, you know. So, I mean, I think, you know, going, you know, going into some of those newer neighborhoods like in North Raleigh and stuff like that, driving around, walking around and kind of, you know, I, I know my brother's kids who lived in places like that and they seem to enjoy living there. Everything's just very convenient and they walk to work. Well, and I think um, when you mentioned your brother's kids, I think the kinds of neighborhoods that, um, the kinds of people who are attracted to neighborhoods like this are folks who are, you know, younger. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's just what the demographics look like. You know, the the homes are tend to be smaller, you know, less square feet. They're more affordable. And then it's a walkable neighborhood. Um, if you have a park, young children, you know, it, it's, it's that kind of busy out and about energy um, that's inspired. So, you know, that goes to meeting a diversity of need. You know, we do have younger families here. Um, of course, the housing market lately, at least, of course, um, they haven't necessarily um, sold to full-time residents. Uh, it's been more of a uh, investment type of activity. I think the other, then um, there's no opinion in this, but this is more of a devil's advocate. Does this begin to cannibalize potential businesses that would go up here? That's something else to think about. Are we full here? I mean, I know there was so many vacancies, so oh, it's full. Well, I mean, I mean, the village place, yeah. the new development, does that begin to pull away from businesses yeah. that may potentially locate there? I mean, it's just something to think about as part of the equation. Yeah, you don't want this place to become a ghost town. Yeah. Well, I think putting all of our eggs in one or one basket or the other, I mean, yeah, I mean, the housing market's hot. People want to build. People want to buy. But suppose we implement that here and then the market goes bust and you have a whole area that's residential that sits for 25 years. Sure. I mean, do, do you, I mean, I think some sort of mixed approach is probably the smarter approach. I'm saying that as, as with a planning hat on, not an investment hat on at the moment. So, I mean, again, eggs in one basket is probably not the best approach. Well, the Potter Hill is a great example. Look how long they've had that park there. <laughs> I mean, I've been driving past there for 20 years. Forever. You know, now you're like, holy, is someone's building there? You know, yeah. the industrial park down by the dump. You know, I guarantee one day that will get built out. Uh, one you of know. the other things I think we need to think about that differentiates this from the um, village core area is this is a uh, entry. This is one of our gateway neighborhoods into Pinehurst. Granted, it, it doesn't get quite as much traffic as some others, but, you know, folks coming up from the beach or... You know, this is the way you come into our community. Um, so that that visibility, I think, is important. And thinking about what, what do we want people to see as they drive in that has a this is Pinehurst moment to it. I have another question that I'm going to take care of that. I don't probably is not a consideration. Are schools are all controlled by the county? Is that right? Am I right? So um it doesn't matter what impact we'd have in either scenario or a combo on impact on on elementary school. I'm just thinking about what's happening with Pinehurst Elementary and all the um, mobile classrooms and everything else. And I'm wondering why there wouldn't have been some kind of proposal by the county or even less. I don't know. Or some something down in the well. There is there is the new elementary school, Aberdeen Elementary, has just been built down the road on five, from this site. Which is actually some of the traffic congestion. That that now. is indeed yeah. some of the traffic congestion now. Well, it's a that's a DOT conundrum. You know, I'm saying is that created? So we're going to create more of that with putting. A lot Depends of how they allocate. I mean, children from this area may go to the. Aberdeen Elementary and Mago. It depends. Well, they re they realign the, uh, the enrollment. Figure out what those are. Right? So, have you gotten any Where guidance, going to school? Darren? What? You feel like you've gotten in some guidance on this? I, yes. I got some guidance, but I, I mean, overall, I mean, I'm I'm still 
Uh, we don't have we don't have a full commission here, but I think there. I I I I'm hearing what some of the concerns are. Louise, you didn't you didn't anything else that you had to add to this conversation? All right. Well, this is clearly a um, an item that the village council will have to decide as they finalize this plan. But I'm going to ask for a recommendation from you. They will ask for a recommendation from the staff and or us. Well, I think if, if we're going we're going to tee this. If you're that's going, the case, I mean, we only have six people yeah. here, but I think we can we can do yeah, a, think, a roll call as to whether or not it should go mixed use and or a reserve for. Yeah, we did that. For, we 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 did that on village place. That we got a yeah, I mean, okay it's just it? a roll. What, what what do you feel about the what do you feel about the current land use proposal uh, for Piner South? In this southern part of the area that's showing residential versus, versus reserving everything for uh, commercial. Uh, make, uh, commercial offices. Right. So, I mean, we can just do a poll. Paul? I, I go back to that mixed use. I mean, convenient, walkable. I mean, that has always been, you know, we've had multiple discussions when we talked about the, the cottages. Um, it was always the walkability in that area as we developed through it. So, yeah, I would go back to it becomes a you know, almost its own, you know, microcosm, I guess, of, of Piners, where everything you need is right there. So I, I don't know if I'm answering you the way you Our want it question. answered, Darren, but. Um, yeah, I think mixed approach is, is probably the appropriate. Rational. Uh, I will kind of stick to my original guns, which was um, I feel that we do need to reserve space for professional. Julian? Mixed use. Yeah, I agree with mixed use. Let me clarify mine. Mixed use with, I like the office core with mixed use exterior. It's kind of what, kind of like you have here. It's oh. the office core surrounded by the sort of residential mixed use area. More of a, it's more of a horizontal mixed use overall development. Yeah. yeah. Is, is that helpful to you? Yeah, it is. It's very, no, it's very helpful. I mean, Again, we don't have a full board here. We're Understand. not asking for a, for, a, for a recommendation, but it's very helpful. Okay. Because I got to. Okay. There was only a, a couple other things. One is, um, if that were the case, if we dis if you decided on mixed use, then the zoning in the western side of uh, Beulah Hill or Route Five, you, we're still talking about uh, multifamily of some nature, correct? Okay, I, yeah. I don't think that changes at all. Correct. Yeah, nothing's changing. On, no, no, okay. Nothing would change over here because this is how all. The, how about the question as to whether or not Trotter Hill should even be included in the uh, ongoing discussion? We can pull it out. I mean, it, it's part. It's been a part of the planning effort for, since day one. The only thing. The only thing that it, that what's if we don't put the foreign based code on it or make any changes, we don't have to because nothing. So we, we can just pull that out of that because because we know that's only going to be infill development. Or do we like some of the or is there some design standards that we might like, architectural standards, things like that? Right, so, well, we have an eclectic set of uh, we do. designs it's, right now. It's, so. <laughs> it is. So maybe, you're right, it doesn't have to apply, Jack. But, yeah. It, well, it, I, so you're saying that it wouldn't really matter whether we uh, no, no, choose we'll, to exclude it from the consideration going forward? Yeah, it doesn't, I mean, we. it doesn't, no, because we don't have to make any, we, if we don't want to, we really don't have to make any zoning changes. So there's no extra work by including uh, Trotter Hills in the no, uh, ongoing there's, discussion. There's there's more work if I have to take it out now. Okay. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's important, I think. It, yeah. it is. Right. No, it, anything else? Yeah, any other? Well, there's a couple of small questions I had relative to the um, Arnett versus uh, Olivia. Mm -hmm. I noticed that the, um, it appears that the railroad improved, improved, if you want to call it that, uh, the crossing at Arnett. I don't know if you've that was happening today? Was we here in the last day or so. Oh, okay. Um, the question is, and they also scraped the road or the, the, the clearing between Arnett and Olivia. So are they saying that they're going to, is there a message there that they're going to close the Olivia Street no, uh, crossing? No, I've not heard that. And I've, you know, we've heard that Olivia is the preferred outlet at times. Because that's why we Well, regardless, uh, I think that the village should work with the railroad and Aberdeen or whomever and kind of come to a conclusion as to which one of these crossings is going to be the uh, ongoing crossing of choice, so to speak. Because I know the railroad only wants one crossing. They do. They, they only want one crossing. Arnett is the legal crossing. Arnett is the official cr crossing, crossing right now, the DOT crossing. And in order to move that, I'm not sure. 
I don't know what we ha what would happen, what conversations or what approvals have to be gotten because you you do have at least one business sitting there along our net that that could potentially be affected. It's it's an accountant, so it's not taking a lot of retail traffic coming in, but that doesn't mean the accountant's going to be there forever. So my accountant, I got across there. <laughs> that's also All right. that's also my accountant. I have to cross there. <laughs> Well, in either case, the oh, village okay, would have net. to approve the access between the two. No, streets. you're right. You're ab you're absolutely right. I've always thought I've always contended that I thought Olivia was was the better crossing because it's a T crossing with Dawkins across the street. So if you're coming out our net, you're coming out with a potential. You know, you got Cotton over here, and then you got Dawkins, and so if you're making a left hand turn and somebody else is making a left hand turn, that's that's been the only concern. Unless it was divided highway, then you wouldn't and have regardless, any And there's been some consideration or question as to who owns Olivia and where well, the uh, where the dividing line between and is it in fact a platted road owned by the village? I know that is a ongoing question. Right. Should be resolved you're before this comes. You're correct. Uh, obviously. Yep. Anything else? The no The only thing I will point out again is that I've heard a lot of positive statements about parks and or public space in this area, regardless of how it gets developed, is that to the extent possible, the village should encourage and or acquire land and or require uh, a substantial public space uh, component. I, I think the requirement, the public space complex, you'll start to see, I think there's some re recommendations that all development provide at least at least 8% open space. And that's not setbacks, that's not stormwater. So if we were doing a, a large, Say this was a large development, all one development, we'd say we want 8% of that to be devoted as, as some type of park. It's not going to get, it's probably not, it's not going to get you to, to that acreage, but we can do little things like that uh, right. to require some dedication. Well, I think with, uh, you know, I really agree with what Jack's saying, and I think it goes back to that gateway idea that when you drive in to, you know, the home of golf, it's nice to see some green space. An attractive uh, green space. I'm going to be the dissenting opinion here about parks. <laughs> um, because parks take a lot of taxpayer money and they take a lot of maintenance. Um, what I, to me, this is massive. This is a huge green space that we have on here. Um, I like green space, but this to me seems like overkill. Um, and I would propose potentially to fold it in to what Jules is saying, is there a way to put green space on the Highway 5 entrance corridor that the village purchases, take it out of this potential development area, and you kind of you kind of kill the two birds with one stone? But I'll also say that green space is not visible from the road. It's not visible from the road. So, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, look, we love our pine trees. It's going to block everything. So, <laughs> it, if we bring that green space, put it along Highway 5, potentially along the railroad, um, does that give us an entrance entry corridor into Pinehurst? It opens up more development area. We also have green space. I mean, I think it accomplishes multiple objectives, including potential stormwater retention for multiple businesses. <laughs> well, the, that's the, the part where you'd want it. What's there, 73 acres there? So No, uh, no, there's probably, the Mahaley tracks, what, 27 acres and the one below it's eight to ten, something like that. So I think you've got thirty some. Oh, okay, yeah, so that's eight percent. That's not much. But I think there are create. Look, I'm not an engineer by any standard, but I think there are creative ways to implement stormwater retention into a green space that is also functional. Yes, you can. You can do it. Yeah, yeah, it's doable. Um, that way, maybe we, it allows for larger office space in this area because we're not we're not encumbered by having stormwater pond on every single property. That's correct. You can do things like that. I think it goes back to Paul's uh, statement as to whether the villages are ready to invest in the infrastructure and, and to which uh, which will help develop it the correct way. And if you're doing a, I'm sorry, if, if you're doing a walkway like the um, picture depicted, I mean, you could actually have multiple gr along that walkway, you know, multiple small parks, you know, size of this room or smaller, you know, where you have areas where people could picnic or play or whatever, you know, and then I think that would go back to Jules's comment. If you drive in there looking on the, you know, right-hand side of the road, you're going to see walking path, bike paths, picnic mm -hmm. places and everything else. So, I mean, you may get a two-fer or three-fer out of it. 
and then put, uh, you know, Phillips retention pond in there. I mean, Ducks. and we we are showing some of those connected green spaces. So you got spaces like this, you got spaces like this. So it's again, it's a concept, and then we're showing this connection. So you could actually, hopefully, you could walk this connection up to the road, up to here. So more. Do you have any other um, issues, concerns you'd like to? No, I think no, I think you guys did a, a wonderful job. I think we got a lot of guidance. I will I will note that you know we did have that open house on what date was that? 29th, we had an open house where we invited the property owners out, and I think we had, we had a, I think we ended up having maybe 20 people, 20-ish people to show up at the meeting. Uh, we did have a, we did have a, a contingent of people that came in from Jackson Hamlet, wanted to understand, you know, kind of what the plans were. So we spent some time with them, spent some time with the largest property owner in in Piner South that, that is currently marketing that property. So, you know, we got some good, I think we got some good feedback, heard some concerns. Um, I think we did have a concern about this road along Page Street. We're showing this as a road. It's really a private street up to a certain point, and then it becomes, it's really a private street with parking on either side of it. So there's concern about how that was being represented on the plan. We drove through there today a little bit. It's, it's, it's wide enough for a street to connect in through here at some point. Um, so. Well, there's no question, some clarification is what is public roads and what are yeah, private roads and about which. That. And that many roads need some uh, some improvement in the area, uh, I would say. Uh, yeah, I think you're right, Jeff. I mean, uh, as you're talking is about, the village ready to step up to that. Oh. Yeah. I, will, I will add. I'm going to get back to the green space. One more <laughs> thing that it accomplishes by pulling it over. I know this is the hill I'm going to die on tonight, but <laughs> you talked about a potential, you know, easing the conversation with the, the folks in Jackson Hamlet. So maybe if you build that green space along that Highway Five corridor. On the back side of their houses, maybe that alleviates any pain points that they may have as well. I mean, it just, I feel like it accomplishes so much more pulling out of that center um, than just having something to look at in the middle. And and remember, the, it's a concept that, yeah, yeah, I know. all these are concepts that the park is a tough one to make happen unless it's a public private partnership. I mean, right. it really does. But it won't happen, almost won't happen if it doesn't show up on the plan. Because nobody's going to think about it uh, if it does it 10 years from now. You know, who, who's going to, some people may not remember that. You have to think out of the box. I mean, who would have thought Central Park in New York was a good idea at the time? I, I, Frederick Law Olmsted. <laughs> <laughs> and Olmsted. <laughs> I kind of agree with Philip, though. I have a hard time not knowing what the park needs are, saying this is what we need. You know, I don't, you know, usually we have some kind of idea about. You have a plan. Overall. And I guess we could go back to the comp plan if it made recommendations in there. So, you know, just, it is a large area. And not just parks, but there's several other issues that I wish we knew the needs for. Well, the, and the park issue, I, I tell you, the park issue got added on. I, I mean, it, you saw those original renderings. It was not shown in this fashion. So we heard the concepts at that public workshop in number two, we want more green space. So this was an effort to put more green space on. Maybe it's not the right mix, maybe it needs to be more, but we had to start with, so we started with something to try and fulfill, you know, that, those comments that we're hearing. So this was how we, how we tried to do it. Well, as you well know, anytime you ask the public for what they want, you're going to get the wish list. And, you know. Well, we try it and we try and give them what their wish list Nothing are. Nothing wrong with that. You know that. <laughs> Can't always do it. So, so, uh, so this is great. Are there any other issues that uh, the board members may want to bring forward, discuss? If not, then uh, we'll close out the conversation about the uh, small area plans. That was okay. Great. So, the uh, is there any other issue at all uh, that uh, any members of the board would like to discuss or bring forward at this time? The next meeting date is scheduled for May fifth. That's our regular meeting, correct? And uh, May fifth. <laughs> it's my birthday. I'm, I can't be. May fifth, I believe. That's what you wrote down here. Um, we may, if we need to do a special meeting, let me. I got to talk through where we are and some of these things. So, if I need to do a special meeting, we'll just pull you. With uh, regards to what? Would be small area plans. If, more on the small area plan. Yeah. If we need to do something on that. Um, if we don't, then what was that? <laughs> Not for me this month. Calendar's okay. filled. All right. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, 
regret to say I will not be here for your tequila birthday nacho social. Oh, so just I was buying, but if you can't <laughs> if you can't show up, then nobody gets anything. Yeah. <laughs> you are lost. <laughs> it, it sounds like. Yeah. All right, thank you. There being no other business, I uh, will entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Make a motion to adjourn the meeting. We have a motion from Sonia and a second by uh, Ms. Mercurio uh, to adjourn the meeting. Any uh, votes on that? Those in favor saying aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned.